torrent broke out almost in her ear. She turned suddenly and realized that the speaker did not see her on the bench. He stood not far from the doorway of the living quarters, a gnarled, bitter figure leaning upon a long rake. Ach, der Schwein! Miss Withers had a vague knowledge of German and of French, left over from her school days, and after a moment she realized that this endless torrent was a combination of both, which must be Swiss. Yet most of the words were, luckily, unfamiliar to her. Here and there she caught one which made the back of her neck turn bright red. She made ready. There was always something to be said for the power of a surprise attack. She jumped up like a jack-in-the-box. Who are you? she demanded, raising her umbrella threateningly. Who am I? She asks me, who am I? The harsh voice rose, shrill and high. Me! I'm poor Chris Thor. Me! I'm the slave who must work week in and week out to make all smooth the grass, where those verdamta pigs go joyriding with their unspeakable ambulance. His voice was full of great sobs. Suddenly Miss Withers felt a certain sympathy for him, especially now that the ambulance came lurching back towards the clubhouse, leaving dark, deep furrows in the soft turf, wheels spinning erratically right and left. She tried to make some properly sympathetic remark, but Chris Thor turned back towards his lighted doorway, shoulders slumped despondently. Es ist nicht der Muerwelt, was his parting shot. Miss Withers turned to see the inspector beside her. I don't like that old buzzard, he observed. What was that last crack? Something about life being a bowl of cherries, Miss Withers translated freely. I'm afraid Thor is a pessimist. Maybe, said Piper, as they walked back towards the shack. From what I hear, he's got reasons. This place barely pays expenses. Next spring, they're going to condemn most of it for the new parkway. And his wife ran off with a traveling man or somebody last August. But didn't I see a girl in the office? Miss Withers asked. Piper nodded. That's Molly Gorgon, a neighborhood girl that he hires to take care of the office and sell tickets to the players. Which reminds me, I'd better tell the boys it's okay to let her go home. We've been holding everybody. Hold her for a while longer. Miss Withers decided. I want to see Molly. Molly Gargan was something to see, beyond a doubt. Miss Hildegard Withers was prone to attach more importance to feminine brains than to beauty. But the black-haired girl with the bright blue eyes and full, sculptured body was positively breathtaking. She sat at a stool behind the counter, staring out of the window at the darkness of the golf course. Oddly enough, her blue eyes were raining tears down an utterly calm and lovely face. She wore a modest pink dress that was obviously homemade, and as Miss Withers came through the doorway, she noticed that Molly Gargan had torn that dress in five or six places along the collar. Now, as if no part of herself, her long fingers were busily tearing yet another place. Miss Withers cleared her throat. <clears> throat> uh, whatever happened out on the course, it can't affect you, young woman, can it? Molly started, and then her lips tightened. Of course not. Miss Withers tried a rather mean trick. The young man whom they arrested, she said casually, insists that this morning, when the foursome started to play, they all purchased balls here. Molly nodded her lovely, dark head. And he claims that all four of them bought balls with a red diamond on them. Is that true? Why, no, they... Suddenly Molly stopped short. Uh, yes, that's right, she said evenly. I remember now. Like fun you do, Miss Withers said under her breath. Where do you live, Molly? Through the window, Molly Gargan pointed to a white house, perhaps a mile away, where the lights of the boulevard were glaring. My father runs a filling station, she confessed. Very well, Molly, Miss Withers advised. The police asked me to tell you that you may go home now. Thanks, said Molly Gargan fervently. 
With one quick motion, she pulled a sweater over her dress, slapped a tam o over her dark hair, and was out of the door. Miss Withers watched the girl as she took a shortcut across the darkened golf course in the direction of that dim white blotch in the distance, which was home. Then she was aware that someone watched beside her. It was Chris Thor, shaking his head. They all are like, he observed gutturally. Women! He crossed to the cash register, pressed the no-sale key, and scooped out the day's takings, a sorry morsel. Then he ostentatiously locked the display case, as if Miss Withers would have been likely to go in for shoplifting golf balls and wooden tees. You can't blame her for hurrying away on a day like this, Miss Withers reminded him. What if she did forget to close up? She's a very pretty girl. Chris Thor didn't seem interested in pretty girls. Bah, said he, the prettier they are, the less they know. I hope soon she gets married, and I hire a good sober girl, homely as a mud fence, yeah. He moved around, turning out electric lights. You go home now. Everybody go home, yeah? I go to bed. Everybody went home, except for one chilled and unhappy cop who was assigned, according to regulations, to cover the scene of the crime. Patrolman Walter Fogel spread out a newspaper on the damp grass under the elms and prepared for a long and lonely vigil above the dark and leaf-choked pool. The wind howled eerily in the treetops that night, and the pale October moon was hidden behind ragged wisps of cloud. Patrolman Fogel realized that it lacked but a night or two of being All Hallows' Eve, and towards morning he dozed off into a nightmare of witches and goblins and howling, dancing wraiths. He awoke with a jerk to see a spectral white figure moving near the edge of the pond. Fogel blinked, pinched himself, and blinked again, but the figure remained. Hey, he mouthed through dry and trembling lips. The white figure became a statue. What the hell are you doing there? demanded the patrolman. Stop, or I'll fire! The apparition dissolved in the direction of the clump of trees and brush further down the gully. Stop! yelled Fogel. His gun came out, and he blazed away furiously, but to no avail. Next morning, shame-faced, he made his report. Maybe it was a, a dead ghost, and, and maybe it wasn't, he insisted to Captain Platt. But I know for one thing that it could run like a rabbit. And it wasn't old Chris Thor nosing around, because I went back to the clubhouse and dragged him out of bed. Look at his shoes, asked the captain. Heavy do, wasn't there? The cop nodded. His shoes were dry, and he was sound asleep. Okay, said his chief. Go home and grab some sleep. We may want you this afternoon. At that moment, Miss Withers and the inspector were in deep conference. It's funny about the medical examiner's report, Piper was saying. The doc insists that falling skull was of normal thickness and that a golf ball would have to be traveling with the speed of a bullet to make such a wound. Oscar, suggested the school teacher, isn't that an idea? I mean, couldn't you shoot a golf ball out of a gun? He shrugged. Certainly not without leaving powder marks. Even if you could get a gun barrel improvised out of a pipe or something. And as for that, Max van Donnen just reported to me that while that golf ball bears traces of blood which checked with farlings, it's never been struck with a golf club. The waxy covering is intact under the microscope. So there goes your gun theory. Miss Withers nodded. I suggested the gun because, you see, Oscar, I spent two hours this morning taking a golf lesson from a professional at the Lakewood Country Club. He's a better golfer than even young Farling, and he can drive a ball 400 yards or lift one neatly into a tin pail 20 feet away. But not both at the same time, Oscar. By that, I mean you can't combine speed with absolute accuracy in golf which means that we're right back where we started, said Piper. 
She shook her head. We know that Ronald Farling didn't kill his foster father, at least not by driving a ball at him. Oscar, I think we're making this case too complicated. Did you get the report from the telephone company? He shook his head. Takes them time to trace those calls, he pointed out. But I don't see why you think we'd learn anything if we knew how many phone calls, if any, have been made from the clubhouse to Farling's office on Broadway, and vice versa. You don't think... She nodded. When there's a girl as startlingly beautiful as Molly Gargan in a case, you can take it for granted that she is somehow a part of the picture. Suppose the dead man has been playing regularly on that little course just to see the fair Molly, had become involved with her somehow, and then cast her adrift. And suppose the odd little Mr. Thor secretly nursed a love for his pretty clerk and wanted to avenge the slight. She stopped and shook her head. Thor doesn't love the girl. On the contrary. And besides, Farling would not have brought his friends and son to play golf of the course after he was through with the girl. She sank into a chair. I'm afraid we've drawn another blank. Just then, the telephone rang, and Piper listened eagerly. He made notes on a piece of paper. Well, he said, in a past three months, there have been 14 phone calls from the golf course office to Farling's office, 23 from Farling's office to the course, and 7 from the Farling home on Fifth Avenue to the course. Which means that your case against young Farling is blown higher than a kite, Miss Withers reminded him. Besides, he couldn't have been the midnight prowler who frightened Patrolman Fogel out of his alleged wits last night. She frowned. Oscar. You ought to drain that pool. Piper laughed. So you are looking for another body. Another body, or another golf ball, she reminded him. A golf ball with specks of powder burns on the cover, and a trademark which might be anything but a black spade. Draining that pool seems like something of an engineering problem, Piper objected. Besides, and I think you ought to turn Ronald Farling loose, she went on. There may be more to discover from him, if he's free, than if he's in the lockup. The more we discover, the worse off we are, Piper objected. I naturally have had the other two members of that foursome investigated. Sullivan has been talking over the radio on behalf of the Citizens Committee, and naturally has been panning some of Farling's friends in politics. But the two men were personal pals. As for the partner, Sam Firth, he didn't gain anything from Falling's death, and he's probably lost a good share of his law business. Neither of them business, Miss Withers snapped. We're missing the whole key to this affair. I wish I knew more about pretty Molly Gargan. I still believe that she's the catalytic agent. Piper shook his head. Doesn't look like she'd throw a fit to me. I said catalytic, not epileptic. Miss Withers snapped. Don't you remember your chemistry? Well, with a girl as beautiful as she around, anything that happens involves her somehow. Oscar, I'm going to telephone her and arrange for a quiet little talk. She asked for information and then was connected with Gargan's gas station on Queens Boulevard. It was a worried Irish voice which answered her. Molly, this is her father speaking. No, she's not here. She went out early this morning without giving me my breakfast. What? No, she didn't pack a suitcase. She was wearing a pink dress, I suppose. Miss Withers put down the phone. Oscar, doesn't pink look white at night? She gave him no time to answer. Come on, she insisted. I think we're on the trail of something, and I don't like the scent. Now listen objected her old crony. Good heavens, woman, I've got a bureau to run. It'll run by itself, she came back. And the inspector followed, for he knew her of old. We'll first have a talk with young Farling, she decided. Tell a man to drive us to the Queen's lockup. But when they had reached that outlying station, they found that the talk with young Ronald Farling would have to be postponed indefinitely. He's flew to coop, was the way Captain Platt put it. About half an hour ago, 
Sam Firth, his father's partner, came out here with a writ of habeas corpus. They'd got wind of the medical examiner's report, which cast doubt on the golf ball angle. So it's up to me to book the kid for murder or let him go. And we didn't have enough on him. We can get him again if we need him, said Piper. Well, Hildegard? We need him now, she said shortly. Find out for me just what is the situation out of the golf course, will you? Anybody there? Captain Platt reported that Fogel was due to go back on duty at the course within the next few minutes, having had a short relief. We always keep a cop around the scene of the crime for a couple of days, he informed her. Otherwise, the place is closed up. Miss Withers then realized that Molly Gargan couldn't possibly be on duty. There would be no need to have her sitting on the stool behind that counter in the clubhouse. Yet where was she? Oscar, she insisted, will you take me over to the course? But for heaven's sake, let's have no blaring of sirens this time. They approached Meadowland very quietly indeed, and at Miss Withers' instigation, the squad car was parked far down the Macadam Road. Then, leaving the uniformed driver at the wheel, the inspector followed Miss Withers over the wire fence and across the turf. Good Lord, woman, are you still hopping on that pool? She sniffed and led the way. I want a description from Patrolman Fogel of that ghost he saw, she admitted. But Fogel was not on duty above the pool. Another uniformed man approached after a moment, crashing through the underbrush down the gully. He snapped to salute. Where's Fogel? asked Piper sharply. Hasn't relieved me yet, sir. I guess last night was too much for him, because he was due at two o'clock and it's nearly half past. What were you doing off your post? Looking for him? The cop reddened. Ah, uh, no, sir, I... I thought I seen something moving down there. Piper shook his head. I guess all you men out here believe in fairies, he growled. Was it a grinning skull or a snake with wings? No, sir, said the patrolman seriously. It was a young guy in golf clothes, and he could run like a deer. Yeah, said Piper. But Miss Withers, who had climbed back to the edge of the gully, was staring out over the course. He still is, she remarked. Running like a deer, I mean. And if he doesn't look out... Piper and the cop joined her, in time to get a clear if distant view of a young man who looked very much like Ronald Farling as he vaulted the wire fence into the road and was immediately clasped in the brawny arms of the uniformed man who drove Piper's car. When the others came up, he was arguing furiously with his captor. Let him go, ordered Piper. Ronald Farling, looking a little wild and disheveled from his night in jail, faced them. I suppose you want to know why I'm here he demanded. Miss Withers shook her head. You're looking for the same thing we are, she advised him. Come with us if you wish. In the words of the popular song, we're heading for the last roundup. They crept towards the clubhouse in silence, keeping always behind the rolling little hills, following gullies and the shadows of scattered trees. Hildegard, what are you up to? Piper begged. I haven't the slightest idea, she admitted, but I'm going to learn something. The wind still blew gustily from the north, driving dead leaves into their faces and bringing the sound of loud voices from somewhere behind the clubhouse. They crept steadily on and finally reached the vantage point of a hedge. From here, they could get a good view of the clubhouse and of the littered yard in the rear, where Chris Thor stood, raking at the refuse. Beside him was Patrolman Fogel. Say, broke out Piper, there's something. But Miss Withers hushed him. Listen. Well then, I bet you twenty dollars against five that you can't hit it in one out of three tries. Thor's voice came clearly and it bore an undercurrent of massed excitement. Fogel scratched the back of his neck and drew out his service gun. You talk too loud, fella, he said. I hate to do it, but I'm going to take your money. 
they were standing perhaps twenty feet from the broken-down piano case, which Miss Withers had noticed last night. Now she saw with a gasp of surprise that a homemade target of black and white circles had been tacked on the side of the box. Okay, Bogle said doggedly. I've got three tries to put a slug in the center of that target, and if I do it, you pay me twenty bucks. He raised his gun. Miss Withers tried to scream and found that no sound issued from her throat. She grabbed the inspector. Stop him! She gasped. Illegal target practice within city limits of New York. Illegal firing of service gun, mumbled the inspector. He stood up quickly. Hey there! What the hell do you think you're doing? The two in the yard whirled to face them. Miss Withers tottered on after the inspector, who glared at the patrolman. Fogel was in a spot, and he knew it. I... Sorry, sir, but he was razzing me about police marksmanship, sir, on account of my firing last night at the ghost or whatever it was. Claimed I couldn't hit the piano box, much less the target. So we made a bet. Piper was grinning. Oh. He thinks cops can't shoot, eh? Chris Thor nodded. Couldn't hit a barn if you were inside with the door shut. Not like the police in Switzerland, let me tell you. Say, Piper rubbed his chin. Fogel, how come you're stalling around here? Don't you go back on duty? At 2 p.m., yes, sir, but I, I just looked at the clock inside and it's only 1.45. He grinned. So I thought I had time to show this guy. Go ahead and show him, Piper ordered. Just this once, we'll forget regulations. Miss Withers could hold herself no longer. Forget regulations and forget the common sense you were born with? She screamed. But first, let me get in that piano box. She attacked it furiously with tooth and nail, but it was stouter than it seemed. Young Ronald Farling came forward to help her, while Thor and the cops looked blankly on. Then at last a board was pried away, and another. Oh, God, cried Ronald Farling. Molly! It was Molly Gargan, her soft young body wound with cruel ropes, her red mouth gagged with a twisted rag. Tenderly, they took her down from the hook which had held her there, with her heart beating just behind the bullseye of the target. Only a half inch of soft pine lay between Molly Gargan and the leaden death which had hung poised above her. It all happened in a split second. Get that man, screamed Miss Withers. Gnarled, dried up Chris Thor suddenly had come alive. He flung Fogel head over heels, knocked the inspector to his knees with the ever-present rake which he had snatched from behind him and was running amok towards the two women. His mouth was open and frothing, and a shrill, endless scream of antic insanity filled the air. Then Ronald Farling stepped in, dodged the swinging iron teeth of the rake, and brought his fist smartly into the madman's groin. Again, and then a right across to the chin that sent him backwards. He did not rise. When things had calmed a bit, they found out why. He had fallen upon the tines of his own rusty rake, and three of the iron spikes had pierced his brain. Farling and the girl leaned against the piano box, touching each other gently, wonderingly. They had no eyes or ears for anything else. But the inspector fairly gnawed at his cigar. Hildegard, it's a madhouse! Not quite, she said. Thor wanted to get Molly put out of the way, and chose this means. Fogel was to have shot her as she stood bound and gagged in the piano box. Then later, Thor would have hidden the body out on the course somewhere, and with one or more bullets from Fogel's gun in the body, he would be the one to be suspected, particularly since he shot wildly at a phantom last night. Well, yeah, but what phantom? I imagine it was Thor in his nightshirt and barefoot, Miss Withers went on. He didn't know that there'd be a guard at the pool, or at least he wasn't sure. He had some unfinished business there. So you say, objected Piper. But why would Thor want to kill Molly here? Ask her, 
said Miss Withers. She knows. Molly did know. It was because she had feared and suspected Thor for some time, and therefore, when her sweetheart was arrested for the murder of his foster father, she had started scouting around. And you found what? Miss Withers asked. I found that there were some brown stains on the end of Thor's rake handle, said Molly Gargan. And suddenly the whole thing was clear to Miss Withers. That's why he tied you up when he found you examining his rake. It was the murder weapon, not the golf ball. Piper shook his head. You're still crazy. What possible motive would there be for Thor to kill Farling? A very good one. Enter the pool once more, Oscar. You see, Farling must have been looking for his lost ball and have poked at the water with that dead stick, just as I did. And Thor, lurking nearby, saw him probing the pool and rushed up to hurl his rake like a javelin. The rake handle is just the diameter of a golf ball, Oscar. He thought of that when he'd finished the deed, so he took the one remaining ball from his victim's bag, touched it to the wound, and dropped it nearby. He wanted it to appear like an accident, Oscar. But why in the name of heaven should Thor object to having falling poke around in that pool? Your guess is as good as mine, said Miss Hildegard Withers. We won't know for sure until you drag the pool, as I've begged you to do again and again. But I've got a pretty good idea that you'll find the sunken body of the wife, who is supposed to have left Chris Thor last August and run away with a traveling man. Well, who'd have suspected that? exclaimed Piper. Who indeed? But I, Miss Withers flashed back. Stuart Palmer Charles Stuart Palmer, one of the great writers of comic detective fiction, was born on the 21st of June 1905 in a farmhouse on the Baraboo side of the Butterfield Bridge on the outskirts of Portage, Wisconsin. A lively child, Palmer played an active role in the junior branch of the Lower Narrows Farmers Club in Portage, participating in social events like ice cream suppers and musical evenings, singing along to music, played on a graffanola. At Baraboo High School, he demonstrated an aptitude for poetry, and his first published work was a poem, The Saner Memory, which appeared in the Chicago Tribune under the pen name The Dauber. That pseudonym reflected an equally precocious talent for drawing, which led to Palmer studying at the Chicago Art Institute and then at the State University, where he began writing in earnest. Various articles were published in the university's literary magazine and in the Daily Cardinal, whose popular Skyrockets column was edited by Palmer. He also contributed cartoons and skits to The Octopus, a campus humour magazine of which he also eventually became editor. In later years, Palmer would claim to have had all sorts of jobs after he graduated, even a spell with the Ringling Brothers' famous circus. And perhaps he did. What is certain is that he wrote, a lot, with cartoons and short pieces appearing in College Humor, Life, The New Yorker, and Judge. And he also edited several magazines, including Dance and Ghost Stories which published Palmer's enduring hoax about the mysterious disappearance of David Lang, an entirely fictitious Tennessee farmer. Ghost Stories also published Palmer's first novel, The Gargoyle's Throat, 1930, as well as several stories under the pseudonym Theodore Orchards. While working as a journalist, Palmer also retained strong links with his university, editing a selection of undergraduates' work, Wisconsin Writings, 1931. The anthology was published by the Mohawk Press, which also published Palmer's second novel, Ace of Jades, 1931, in which precocious teenager Bubbles Deegan becomes embroiled with a bootlegger. Ace of Jades drew Palmer to the attention of a larger publisher, Brentano's, where his editor suggested he next write a detective story, 
and set it in the New York Aquarium. The result was The Penguin Pool Murder, 1931, in which Palmer introduced a police inspector, Oscar Piper, and a horse-faced Iowa schoolteacher, Miss Hildegard Withers. Although it has been suggested that Palmer was influenced by Anna Catherine Green's tales of spinster Amelia Butterworth and police detective Ebenezer Grice, Palmer often said that he conceived Withers only as a minor character for comic relief, but had found her taking over. Withers was based on Miss Fern Hackett, Palmer's high school head of English, whom he claimed had made his life miserable for two years but started him off as a writer. The film rights to the Penguin Pool murder were sold quickly, and James Gleason and Edna May Oliver cast as Piper and Miss Withers. As Willis Goldbeck worked on the script, Palmer fell in with the publicity drive, announcing his intention to travel to the Galapagos Islands to bring back the required penguins and suggesting that, if the expedition failed, a couple of trained ducks be made up as penguins. He also arranged for the film to have its premiere at the Al Ringling Theatre in his hometown of Baraboo. The Penguin Pool Murder, 1932, was an immediate success, and two more films followed quickly. Murder on the Blackboard, 1934, scripted again by Goldbeck, and Murder on a Honeymoon, 1935, adapted from Palmer's novel The Puzzle of the Pepper Tree. 1933, by Seton Miller and the humorist Robert Benchley. Unfortunately, Edna May Oliver left the series after the third film, and neither of the actresses that followed, Helen Broderick and Zazu Pitts, was a success. In 1933, Palmer moved to New York, and from there he relocated to Laguna Beach, California, where he later claimed to have built up an extensive collection of penguin statuettes second only to Roland Young, while his pets apparently included a Woodhousian cat called Persmith and a wire-haired puppy called Pajones. Although he would move house several times, Palmer remained in California for the rest of his life, gradually being joined there by others in his family. After sharing credits on scripts for films like Hollywood Stadium Mystery, 1938, co-written with Doral McGowan and Stuart McGowan, and Yellowstone, 1936, The Great Geezer Murder Mystery, with Jefferson Parker, Palmer began writing scripts on his own for mysteries and comedies such as Who Killed Aunt Maggie, 1940, and Pardon My Stripes, 1942. With the entry of the United States into the Second World War, Palmer spent six years with the Army, attaining the rank of Major, making training films, and later serving in Washington, D.C. as liaison officer between the Army and the film industry. A few years later, writing as J. Stewart, a name inspired by his father, Palmer drew on his wartime experiences for Before It's Too Late, 1950, a murder mystery set in and around the Pentagon. Palmer was discharged in 1946, and on returning to Southern California, resumed writing scripts, now mainly for television. He also continued to write novels and short mystery, science fiction and fantasy stories, as well as Sherlockian pastiches. In 1950, Palmer and his great friend, the crime writer Craig Rice, Georgiana and Randolph Craig, won first prize for Once Upon a Train, The Loco Motive, in a short story competition run by Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. As well as fiction, Palmer also wrote from time to time about real-life crime, including the 1932 Wonderwell mystery, and his life story of Bloody Babs Graham was widely syndicated in the press in 1954, the year in which Palmer served as president of the Mystery Writers of America. In the 1950s and 60s, Palmer made several radio and television appearances on shows like You Bet Your Life, hosted by Groucho Marx, whom, incidentally, Palmer later cast in a short story named for the show. In 1961, he wrote a romantic radio play, Three Dimensional Valentine, for a marathon charity broadcast, and in the same year, as Poet Laureate for the Society of Friends of Lizzie Borden, the alleged perpetrator of the Fall River Axe Murders, 
Palmer led an unsuccessful campaign to have a statue erected in her memory. He was active in the Baker Street Irregulars, where he had been ennobled as the Remarkable Worm, and he regularly gave talks at the Long Beach Writers' Club and elsewhere on how to be a writer and keep on living. He even occasionally opened his home in Van Nuys, California, to host workshops for freshmen and sophomore writers, whom he advised, If you seek immortality, you will find it in writing books. You never die when someone reads a page you have written. A ladies' man, Stuart Palmer was married five times, including to Winifred E. Wise, the writer of non-fiction for children, whom he had met at university decades earlier. He died on the 4th of May, 1968. His final novel, Rook Takes Night, 1968, was published posthumously, and after his death, his widow created a scholarship in his name at Glendale College, California. The earliest of around a dozen uncollected Miss Withers stories, The Riddle of the Black Spade, was first published in Mystery in October 1934. A Torch at the Window by Josephine Bell It was a dark night in late autumn when the trouble started. There was no moon, and the large irregular bulk of St. Stephen's Hospital loomed black behind the bright lights at the entrance gates and in the main porter's lodge. Beyond the first two blocks and the outpatient department, the lamp posts on either side of the main drive ended. They gave most light around the sweep of the casualty entrance. Beyond that, a car needed headlights to follow the winding macadam between the other blocks of the main building and the grounds behind them to the new annex block and the hospital boundary. It might have been a narrow country lane, and since the hospital stood on the outskirts of the market town it served, and in daylight there was a fine view over fields and distant hills, the night air there was always clean and sharp, and smelled of the country. In Brodie Ward, in the annex, most of the patients slept. It was after eleven, and they'd been settled down some three hours earlier. Brodie was an orthopedic ward for men, a surgical ward dealing with operations on bones and joints, with a never-ending turnover of road accidents and fractures sustained in factory or home. Because surgical patients of this type are seldom chronically ill people, most of them were sleeping peacefully in darkness. A few blue shaded lights hung over the beds of those freshly operated upon or over new accident arrivals, critically ill from shock or injury. Out of the darkness and the silence, a firm young voice called softly, Nurse! There was a rustle near the entrance end of the ward. A slim figure in uniform came out from the curtain cubicle where a blue light shone and passed quickly down the ward. What is it, Barry? Nurse Farrah leaned over the young man's bed. She could barely see his square, snub-nosed face in the dim light. He was lying back on his pillow, looking up at her with a half-smile. His dark eyes glinted in the light of her pocket torch as she switched it on. Immediately, he covered the torch with a strong hand, extinguishing its beam. Now set light, he whispered urgently. Look out the window. She moved a little from the bed to do so. Outside, the blackness was complete. She could not even see the boundary hedge of the hospital, ten yards away. I don't see anything, she went back to tell him. You've been having nightmares. The boy chuckled. <laughs> no fear. What was it then? Light. Someone came along all the windows this side, shining it in. Midnight snooper. Sure it wasn't a car moving in and out of the car park? It was a torch, I tell you. An ordinary hand torch, like this. With a smile she could not see behind the light, he switched on and handed her back her torch. She gave a little gasp. Barry, you're the limit. I never noticed. He raised himself on one elbow now to point at the window on the other side of the bed. Whoever it was came right down this side, 
flicking his torch into each window. Disappointing for him, wasn't it? He laughed again, a little louder, so that Nurse Farrah had to reprove him in her crisp, rather hard voice. But Barry was irrepressible. He caught at her hand to draw her closer. All that trouble, and he only sees a lot of men. It was Treves' ward he was after, I don't mind betting. Nurse Farrah pulled away her hand. You go to sleep, she said, and none of your nasty ideas in my ward. If you're not off by the time I'm back, I'll have to give you one of your pink pills. He put up both hands in a mock gesture of self-protection, then pulled the bedclothes over his head and gave an artificial snore. Nurse Farrah went back to the concussion case in the blue-lighted cubicle. But Barry's report had disturbed her. Twice before, during her training, they had had this snooper trouble at the annex. The block consisted of six wards, a radium unit, and operating theatres, all low bungalow-type buildings on either side of a central covered way, into which their entrance doors opened. Other doors led into the corridor at the lower end and at three places in the sides between the wards. The boundary hedge behind the annex was the original one, now much broken down with age and very inadequately wired over its worst gaps. A proper wall or even fence would have given some protection. The present arrangement was almost an invitation to intruders. Nurse Farrah determined to satisfy her own curiosity about Barry's report. The boy was a bit inclined to practical joking. He must not be encouraged. He'd been in six weeks now, after a motorbike accident, in which his right leg had been cracked in two places below the knee. At first, he had been exaggeratedly depressed, irritable and difficult. Now he was just the reverse, and the older men in the ward, some of whom were easily offended, were beginning to dislike his new high spirits. So Nurse Farrah decided to check with the other wards in the annex. She called the probationer to watch the serious case and went across the covered way to the door of Treves, a surgical ward for women. As soon as she was inside its outer door, she knew that something was wrong. There were several lights on in the ward, but the outer rooms, ward kitchen, sluice room, sister's office, were all deserted. She pushed open the inner door and went in. A babble of indignant voices rose in her ears as she did so. She saw her opposite number, at the far end of the left-hand row of beds, trying to restrain an hysterical patient who was calling out and attempting to leave her bed. Farrah hurried down the ward. The staff nurse looked up as she drew near. Though she resented Farrah's arrival as a typical piece of high-handed interference, in the circumstances she could not refuse her proffered help. Together, the two nurses succeeded in calming the distraught woman in the bed, to the extent of persuading her to lie back and tell them what had upset her. Don't talk if you'd rather not, Mrs. Holmes, said the Treves ward nurse soothingly. But Mrs. Holmes was eager now to begin. Controlling her sobs, she managed to say, I was having such a, a lovely sleep, and then the light shone in my eyes and woke me up. I thought it was you, nurse, at first. Then the light moved away onto Mrs. Brooke, and I glimpsed an awful face at the window, sort of glaring in, like a horror film on the telly it was. My heart seemed to stop, and then Mrs. Brooke gave a scream, and the lights went on down the ward, and we were all starting up and calling out. I suppose I lost my head a bit. I'm ever so sorry, nurse. She was crying freely now. Nurse Farrah patted her shoulder briskly. We saw the light in Brodie, too, across the way, she said. Someone thinks it's fun to do a peeping Tom, I expect. I hope he's disappointed. We'll report it to Sister, of course. I have reported it, said the nurse in Treves, coldly. She wished Farrah would go, interfering as usual. The only one who knew what to do, of course, and told others to do it. Bossy wasn't the word. Nurse Farrah... Realising at last that her presence in another ward would not look too good if Sister found her there, turned away abruptly and hurried back to her own territory, 
where she immediately rang up Night Sister to tell her of Barry Williams's experience. Though she did not mention the later commotion in Treves. It was the deputy she spoke to. Night Sister had already left to go to the annex, she learned. So, determined to go one better than Treves, she rang up the porter's lodge at the main gates of the hospital. Here she was answered by Bates, the senior night porter. He and his colleague, Holford, shared the work between them, Bates remaining at the telephone exchange and Holford carrying out such jobs as wheeling an emergency case from a ward to an operating theatre and back again later, or taking a dead body from a ward to the mortuary, or directing and assisting an ambulance to park and discharge its occupants. If no such work turned up, Holford's duty was to patrol the grounds once or twice during the night. When Nurse Farrer's call came through, Holford was sitting in the lodge, relaxing with a cigarette and an evening paper. He was not at all pleased, and for some minutes made no attempt to move. Better see if you can locate the perisher, suggested Bates. He only seems to have been at those two walls nearest the hedge, scarpered when the women started their hullabaloo, I reckon. But you better have a look around. I'll give him another minute or two, answered Holford who had no desire to meet the intruder on a pitch-black narrow path in the wilds, as he called the undeveloped part of the hospital grounds between the annex and the main block. I'm not risking my life with a lunatic, and that's what he must be. Nasty-minded beggar at that. Why don't they get on with this plan for a new laboratory? Then it would all join up, so you could walk right through the place without crossing the open. That wouldn't stop a snooper, answered Bates reasonably. Good eye wall with wire on top. That's what we need. Holford put his head out of the lodge, cursed the darkness of the night, and withdrew to take up his torch. It was a powerful one, rubber covered to protect it from rain. He wrapped a scarf around his neck, put on an overcoat, and set off towards the annex, shining a long beam from side to side, but not venturing from the middle of the path as he moved along. Arriving at the annex covered way, he found Night Sister and the two staff nurses standing there. The unwanted visitor had not been seen at any other windows in the block. Evidently, the disturbance he had caused in Treves had scared him away. Hofford reported that he had seen no one on his way from the porter's lodge, and they all agreed there was nothing more to be done. Night Sister left, accompanied by Holford and before they parted at the main building, she asked him to go back again to escort the nurses across the grounds to the main dining room where they had their midnight meal. Rather reluctantly, for the night was cold, Holford set off once more. Meanwhile, in the corridor at the annex, Nurse Farrer and Judy, the staff nurse from Treves, were on the point of returning to their respective wards when they heard a tapping at one of the doors farther up the corridor. Both girls started, but Farrah recovered first and hurried towards the door. When she had peered through the glass upper part, she unlocked it quickly, and Dr. Guy Stevens came through. What's the big idea, locking me out? She told him. Night Sister had ordered all three of the side doors into the covered way to be locked at night until further notice. The main entrance was open, and well lit outside and in. No sinister person would be likely to go near it. Guy Stevens was inclined to make light of the matter. He was a house officer of only two years standing, working on the surgical side. His experience was limited. Nurse Farrah, a couple of years his senior, did not hesitate to tell him so. And you're always right, Betty, aren't you? said Guy, still refusing to be serious. She hustled him into Brodie Ward. He had taken her out once or twice, and she was really rather attracted, except when he behaved as he did now. For his part, Guy was beginning to feel she was more of a liability than an asset, but it was not going to be easy to shake her off. He did his night round in Brodie, and Nurse Farrer went to the door of the ward with him. In the dim light of the corridor, she looked appealing. He caught her hand to pull her to him, but she had been offended by his earlier attitude and was not going to give in now. Judy, 
just inside the door of Treves, heard the ensuing scuffle, and caught sight of Dr. Stevens' furious scarlet face as he was flung out of the annex. Quarrelling again, she thought. Honestly, some people don't know when they're well off. A fortnight passed with no further alarms. Night Sister had reported the occurrence to Matron, who told the hospital secretary, who telephoned the chairman of St. Stephen's House Committee, who mentioned the matter to the chairman of the hospital group management committee. The matter was placed on the agenda for the next cycle of committees, in two months' time. Recommendations would be made and passed on, until they reached the regional board, which would inevitably turn down any project so costly as a wall or an extra member of the staff. The matron, however, did manage to arrange for Holford to act as a permanent escort for the annex night nurses on their way to and from the main dining room. This worked smoothly, until a night when Holford's services were required in the operating theatre at the annex. He was still on duty there at midnight, and the nurses decided that they would go together in a body rather than wait for him. By this time they'd forgotten the former panic, which, after all, had affected the patients much more than the staff. The girls gathered in the covered way, pulling their cloaks around them. Where's Betty? Go and tell her, Judy. The girl was back in a few seconds. She says go without her. One of her patients has gone along to the toilet and not come out. She must wait for him, she says. Typical. She'll catch us up. They trooped off in a body, leaving the wards in charge of the probationers, whose turn for a meal came after their seniors got back. Nurse Farrah did not catch them up. She did not appear while they ate their meal. When they got back to the annex, she was not there. Night Sister and Holford, now free to help, searched the grounds between the main block and the annex, and at three in the morning they found her, lying outside the hospital secretary's office. Dead. The senior registrar was called, and matron, and the police. There was nothing the doctor could do except confirm Night Sister's finding. Before long, Detective Superintendent Coleridge was on the scene, and the investigation was underway. The hospital secretary's office formed one half of a one-story concrete building, situated near the boundary, not far from the annex. The other half held the engineer's stores and had its own entrance. At the office end, a wide door was set back between the two walls of a short porch. Nurse Farrah was lying face downwards in a corner of this porch. Her forehead was grazed. Her neck was broken. On the back of her head was a fairly large bruise. Looks as if she was hit from behind, said the police doctor, who had arrived soon after Superintendent Coleridge. She fell against the corner of the wall, I think, and broke her neck. Otherwise she'd be alive now. This blow wasn't enough to kill her, only concuss. She's been dead about three hours, I imagine. There had been no struggle, no assault, simply that one blow from behind, and the unlucky fact that she was near the door when it was delivered. Why was she here at all? Coleridge asked aloud. She shouldn't have come this way, Matron explained. She ought to have been with the others. She explained the circumstances, and Coleridge nodded. He had seen the hospital report about the snooper two weeks ago. She may have seen or heard someone on the path and gone out of her way to avoid him, he suggested. Matron shook her head. Nurse Farrah wasn't the sort to run away. If she heard anyone behind her, she'd turn to face him and get the better of him, too. She had a sharp tongue in her head and was rather too fond of using it. Poor girl. Superintendent Coleridge did not seem to be listening. The hospital secretary, roused from his bed, had just arrived with the keys to the office. Sorry to get you up, but we need your help, Coleridge explained. Looks as if she noticed something wrong near your office while she was going alone towards the main block. Perhaps a light on inside, or a figure moving. Open up, please. Mr. Walters, considerably shocked and still only half awake, did as he was told. 
When he had opened the door, he stood back, expecting Coleridge to go in. But the superintendent merely pushed the door wide open and shone his torch into the darkness. He saw a short passage with closed doors at either side and an open door ahead. He turned to Walters. Take my torch, he said, and go into the room at the end. That's the main office, I take it? That's right. Walters again did as he was told, and stood in the office, turning the torch slowly from side to side. He was plainly visible from the doorway and beyond. Also clearly to be seen was a large safe. Superintendent Coleridge walked in and switched on all the lights. Right, he said briskly. No disturbance here, but you never can tell. I'll leave you with Detective Sergeant Jones, Mr. Walters. He'll go through everything with you. Try the safe for a start. You keep a certain amount of money there, I suppose? Our wages, yes, and deceased patients' property until it's claimed by the relatives. And petty cash. Just so. Leaving Sergeant Jones to supervise this move and the taking of fingerprints and photographs on the spot, he went away to the main block to pursue his inquiries with the hospital staff. Night Sister, convinced that the crime had been committed by the unknown intruder who had so startled the annex a fortnight before, explained her views with much emphasis. Nurse Farrow was an excellent worker, she said, but a bit too self-reliant. Tonight's behaviour was typical. First, she thinks she ought to make sure all her patients are in bed before she leaves. Quite unnecessary. There's always someone in charge. Then it was very silly to think she could order a grown man out of a lavatory. Was that what she did? So I hear. It meant Nurse Farrah had to start out alone. The others were tired of waiting for her, quite naturally. Even so, it was very officious to go out of a proper way to find out what was happening at the office, if anything was. Superintendent Coleridge pursed his lips. You don't think she had a date? He asked dryly. Sister's face grew scarlet. Our nurses don't behave like that, she said. And don't they have boyfriends? Well, of course they do, but they keep their private affairs for their off-duty periods. I see. The superintendent did not look convinced. It has been suggested to me that Nurse Farrow was interested in one of the resident doctors, and that they had quarrelled recently. Oh, you mean Dr. Stevens? Well, I know for a fact he was in the operating theatre tonight, an emergency appendix. That was why Holford was not able to escort the girls over. I see, said the superintendent again. I wonder if I might have a word with Dr. Stevens. Must you get him out of bed again tonight? I'm afraid so, and it's nearly morning after all. I'd like to see him here in about half an hour from now. Guy Stevens did not appear at his best with the superintendent. He was half asleep and very tired after his exertions of the day before and his work in the theatre only five hours ago. The added shock of Nurse Farrah's violent death only made his confusion and resentment worse. Coleridge was ready to believe he was lying, and rather poorly at that. Do you deny you were interested in this girl? In Betty Farrah? Well, yes, up to a point. Up to what point? Guy flushed. She threw her weight about too much, he said ungallantly. She was so efficient, he amended not wishing to slander the dead, and rather horrified at his own complete lack of any sense of grief or loss. The superintendent had also remarked this. You don't seem much upset, he said. Well, of course I'm upset. It's, it's terrible, but there was never anything serious between us. I've hardly spoken to her for the last couple of weeks. We quarrelled, actually. Sure you didn't make a date tonight? Why should I? To make it up? Sure you didn't meet her and quarrel again? Guy's sleepy confusion parted, and a cold, sinister light shone through at these words. There was no mistaking the superintendent's meaning. I was in the theatre, he said. But the operation was over, and the theatre cleared quite five minutes before Nurse Farrah left Brodie Ward.
When Coleridge rejoined Sergeant Jones, he found that considerable progress had been made. Though the office had shown no signs of disturbance, a large sum of money was, in fact, missing from the safe. The latter had not been forced, however, merely opened. An inside job, obviously. The laborious work of identifying fingerprints began. In the late afternoon of the same day, the superintendent went to Brody Ward. It seemed to him now that his first suspicions of Dr. Stevens had very little foundation. Nurse Farrah must have been attracted to the office by a noise or a light. Perhaps she had seen and recognized the thief, this inside thief who could well be known to her. And who more likely than the staff, particularly the cleaners, whom she knew? On the other hand, she had been struck from behind, perhaps while all her attention was focused on the thief. That suggested an accomplice, and the fact that the blow had not been hard enough to kill might mean a female accomplice. He entered the ward with an open mind. The day sister and her staff were prepared to help, but they knew nothing. Coleridge tackled the patients instead. Some swore they had slept through the night. One or two road accident cases were suspicious and tongue-tied. He gained most from an elderly man, whose broken leg was fixed to an elaborate pulley system. Poor kid, he said, referring to Nurse Farrah. It was her own fault. She'd no business to go chasing up young Barry. Coleridge had heard the story twice. He looked round the ward. You won't find him, the old man went on. He was discharged this morning. Been due to go out for a day or two. Fit? Good as new. And which was his bed? The old man pointed to the drawn curtains round the bed next to his own. He liked joking with the nurses. He wouldn't move while she was badgering him, but he was back from a toilet in his bed inside three minutes after she left. Is that so? Practical jokes, that was his line. I've not said this to sister, but it's my belief that snooper, as they call him, was Barry himself. The old man caught at Coleridge's sleeve. Suppose he pretended he'd seen a face at the window. We were all asleep but him. When Nurse had gone back beyond the curtains of that bad case they had that night, he could nip out to the toilet and climb out and frighten the women in Treves just before she went across to see what they were doing there. Then he'd be back when she got back, see? Coleridge looked at the old man with surprise, which he managed to suppress. You have a new patient in his bed, he asked, changing the subject. Yes. Barry had not been gone an hour when they brought this chap in. Fell off some scaffolding, they say. The superintendent nodded and went away down the ward to the bathrooms. As the old man had said, anyone normally agile could climb through a lavatory window, only a few feet from the ground, and return the same way. He hurried back to find Sister. That young Barry Williams. Did he discharge himself? Oh, no, he's been fit to leave for days now. But his people hadn't brought his clothes. Why not? Londoners, no sense of time or dates. I sent them the usual notice of his discharge. We sent again yesterday, and a friend turned up this morning. Only a friend? In a car? Coleridge nodded and got to work, rather against sister's will, on the cubicle so recently vacated by Barry Williams. As he pointed out, the new patient, being unconscious, would never know about it, and valuable evidence must not be lost. The results of this, taken with the investigation in the office, were revealing. In the office, all the fingerprints taken matched with members of the hospital staff. Those from the cubicle, besides the staff, were identified as belonging to a certain Bernard Grant, who had already two convictions for robbery with violence. Grant, alias Barry Williams, was soon picked up by the London police and questioned. Most of the money from the safe at St. Stephen's Hospital was still with him. He agreed that he had used an alias on admission there after his road accident. 
Since this had been due to a skid and involved no one else, there had been no police inquiry when it happened. What were you doing at the time? Coleridge asked. Just having a run in the country. Planning a job? Certainly not. They got nothing from him but the money, less a deposit he'd made on a new car. The old man's suggestion that he had been the snooper he dismissed with a light laugh, though they thought they detected an uneasy note in it. He refused to say how he had opened the safe, and he swore he'd had nothing to do with Nurse Farrah's death. His mother, when approached, was more revealing. Superintendent Coleridge, again accompanied by Sergeant Jones, went up to St. Stephen's Hospital and asked for Holford. Up at the theatre, Bates told them, and went outside the lodge to point the nearest way to the annex. They were just passing the hospital office building when they met Holford coming down the path towards them. He stopped at once and stayed quite still as they went up to him. James Holford? asked the superintendent. Yes, that's me. Have you a sister called Amelia Grant? Yes. And a nephew called Bernard Grant, alias Barry Williams. Holford's face had gone very white. His eyes wavered from side to side before fixing again on the two police officers. I'm warning you, went on Coleridge. Understand? Yes. When you left the operating theatre on the night of Nurse Farrah's death, did you use this path, passing the office? Always do. The voice was hoarse, reluctant. It would be dark. Did you have your torch with you? Holford made a convulsive move off the path onto the grass, but Sergeant Jones sidestepped also, and he stopped, breathing heavily. Well, did you? Always do, he repeated, in the same tone. And you saw Nurse Farrah looking into the office. The nurses had gone down on her own. I was too late to go with them. Not Nurse Farrah. You expected her to be gone, but you saw her. You knew she had discovered Grant in the act of burgling the safe. So you went up behind and struck her with that big, rubber-covered torch of yours. And you killed her. Holford gave a cry, covering his face with his hands. I never meant it, he groaned, only to give her a mild concussion so she'd forget seeing Bernie. I could have passed it off. She tripped and hit her head on a step or something. Then I found she was dead. I've been out of my mind since. He took his hands away staring at the superintendent. I'd nothing to do with the job, he pleaded. The boy thought that up. Must have. He's been getting about all over the hospital the last fortnight. He's bad all through. I did it for Melly's sake, my sister. I only wanted Nurse to forget. I didn't strike her hard. Coleridge looked at him with contempt. Family likeness, he said. The boy swears he only stole. You say you only killed by accident. You're both as guilty as hell. Robbery and murder. A capital offence. How did Grant get into that office and into that safe if you didn't manage to get keys for him? He wouldn't have had the time or the means. He was back in the ward, going through the toilet window, as he'd been practising, inside three minutes after Nurse Farrah left. I've got a solid witness for that. You'll have to come with us, Holford. And I warn you again. Anything you say? Josephine Bell Josephine Bell was the pseudonym of Doris Bell Collier. She was born on the 8th of December, 1897, in Chalton on Medlock, Manchester, the daughter of Maud Tessimund Windsor, and Joseph Collier, a surgeon. From 1910, she studied at Godolphin School, Salisbury, and in 1916, at the age of 18, she went up to Cambridge University to study natural sciences at Newnham College, taking time out to work on the land towards the end of the First World War. Collier graduated in 1919, the same year that her elder brother Jack was killed in a flying accident in Spain devastating her mother 
and her other brother Donald. In 1922, following in the footsteps of her father and great-grandfather, she decided to become a doctor and enrolled as a student at University College Hospital, London. She was diligent, even working in the emergency department of Hampstead General Hospital as a casualty officer. But she also had time for extramural matters, and on the 6th of January 1923 married Norman Dyer Ball, a pathologist at UCH who had lost an eye in the Great War. The following year, which included a spell as house physician, she gained the customary double degree of Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. The couple moved to Crooms Hill in Greenwich, where Dyer Ball set up in general practice, working alongside his wife until 1935, when ill health forced him to sell up. They moved to Walden in Headley, Hampshire, to stay with Collier's mother, whose second husband, Jean Estradi, had died three years earlier. Dyer Ball's health began slowly to improve, and the couple decided that the following summer they would make a long sea voyage. However, on the day after their 13th wedding anniversary, and not long after he had been involved in a minor car accident, Dyer Ball drove up to London to do some shopping. He bumped into the wife of one of his neighbours at Crooms Hill and offered to give her a lift home. However, their journey ended in tragedy when the car mounted the curb, rolled over twice and collided with a lorry. His passenger died almost immediately while Dyer Ball died in hospital a little time later. Not even 40 years old and widowed with four young children, Collier moved to Borden in East Hampshire. She secured a position as a clinical assistant at the Royal Surrey County Hospital in Guildford and to supplement her income, turned to writing. Her first novel, Murder in Hospital, 1937, dedicated to her late husband, was written under a pseudonym that some have suggested was an homage to the original of Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Joseph Bell. However, the truth is much simpler. In coining the name Josephine Bell, Collier simply combined her own middle name with the first name of her father, who had died in 1905, before she was ten. Any connection to Joseph Bell was at most a happy coincidence. Murder in Hospital was praised for its clever plot and even more so as a study of hospital mores. However, there are moments that jar for modern readers, not least the portrayal of some characters that, while they might simply reflect the attitudes prevailing in the 1930s, are variously anti-Semitic and racist. For the novel, Bell introduced Dr David Wintringham, who would appear in 11 more novels, including From Natural Causes, 1941, which features an unusual method of murder. Death by Clairvoyance, 1949, in which one of six identically dressed clowns is murdered at a buffet. And the horrific Bones in the Barrow, 1953. Wintringham also appears in numerous short stories, many of which were published in the London Evening Standard. As well as the Wintringham series, Collier wrote many other crime novels, often with a medical background, and some with novel settings, such as The House by the River, 1959, set in Brittany, New People at the Hollies, 1961, set in an old people's home, and A Hole in the Ground, 1971, in which a doctor returns to Cornwall to investigate an accident that he had witnessed 20 years earlier. Collier also wrote historical romances and serial thrillers for magazines, such as The Dark Tide, 1951. Her numerous straight novels include the possibly autobiographical Compassionate Adventure, 1946, and The Bottom of the Well, 1940, about a mismatched couple. But the best of her non-crime output are Total War at Haverington, 1947, set during the air raids and chaos of war-torn London, and Wonderful Mrs. Marriott, 1948, about a domineering woman and the damage she wreaks on her family. There was also a non criminous radio drama about a typhoid outbreak entitled Hidden Death, 1949. All the time Collier was writing, she continued to work, 
not least because she had four children to raise on her own. In 1941, she moved to the Royal Surrey's gynaecology department until in 1944, a year after her mother's death, she set up in general practice at Willoughby, 13 Albury Road, Guildford, still also pursuing her hobbies, gardening and sailing her five-ton sloop. After retiring in 1954, Collier joined the management committee of St Luke's Hospital in Guildford, a position she held until 1962. Perhaps more significantly, 1954 was also the year that she was elected a member of the Detection Club, the Dining Society for Crime Writers. A year later, Collier was among the founder members of the Crime Writers Association, later serving as the chair for 1959 to 1960. In this role, she spoke widely on crime fiction, including in 1959 a talk on the history and future of the crime novel to the Literary Society in Cranley, East Sussex. In 1960, she contributed to a series of radio plays by CWA members, and in 1961, a series of short stories written by CWA members for newspaper syndication. After her term as chair ended, Collier remained on its main committee taking part in one of its most unusual meetings, held in the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussauds and broadcast by the BBC in July 1967. Writing almost up until the end of her life, Doris Bell Collier died in 1987. A Torch at the Window was originally published in She, January 1960. Grand Guignol by John Dixon Carr A mystery in ten parts. The performance staged under the direction of Monsieur Henri Boncolin, Prefect of Police of Paris. The cast of characters. Monsieur Henri Boncolin. Monsieur Alexandre Laurent, scholar, former husband of Louise de Saligny, the wife of Raoul, 4th Duc de Saligny, eminent sportsman. Monsieur Edouard Vautrel. Signor Luigi Fenelli, maestro of several enterprises. Jacques Girard, jockey. Mr. Sid Galton, late of Lincoln, Nebraska, USA. François Dilsard, operative of the prefecture. Monsieur le Comte de Villon, juge d'instruction and others. The place, Paris. The time, 1927. The action covers a period of 24 hours. Part 1. The Overture. Danse Macabre. Le jeu est fait, sur et dame. Rien ne va plus. The voices start. It was so quiet that from anywhere in the room you could hear the ball ticking about in the wheel. Then the shrill, bored voice chanted, Van de Noir, sur et dame. One man got up from the table stiffly with an impassive face. He made a defiant gesture at lighting a cigarette, but the flame of the briquet wobbled in his hand. He smiled in a sickly way, and his face glistened when he looked from side to side. A woman laughed. There was the booming of an English voice, swearing triumphantly. Paris has many such miniature casinos, which attract the most mixed throng of any places in that mixed city. This was a long red room in a walled house of a discreet neighborhood at Passy. A harsh color scheme of red and crystal, a harsh sound of voices, and bad ventilation. A harsh jazz orchestra downstairs, mangling tunes already execrable, poor cocktails supplied by the house, and a clientele at once fashionable and dowdy. Above everything, a gloomy tensity of thousands being played across the table. The hard light showed worn places on faces and furniture. The women used too much perfume. Men took an enormous delight in shaking out two thousand franc notes like tablecloths. At a lounge near one of the windows, from which you could see the Citroen advertisement spraying colored lights up the side of the Eiffel Tower, 
I sat with my friend, Boncola. He idly twirled the stem of a cocktail glass. With the points of his hair whisked up and his black beard clipped to a sharp point, he looked even more Mephistophelian than usual. The wrinkles round his eyelids contracted in amusement, and he smiled sideways when he pointed out each newcomer round the clicking wheel. They were interesting. There was Madame that and the Marquise this, octogenarian crones whose faces were masks of enamel and rouge, dyed hair piled like a scaffolding. They smirked and ogled at their gigolos, smooth-haired, pomandered young men whose gestures were like a woman's, but with manners and evening dress flawless. A crone's hand would shoot out like a claw after a new pile of banknotes. Then the gigolo applauded politely and smiled in a glittering way at the leering woman. There was a Russian lady with a Japanese face and a pearl collar. Not beautiful, flourishing skinny arms like wings, but several men were eager to back all her bets. There were loud Argentines, the deepest plungers, and an American too drunk to follow the play, but falling over everybody's chair and demanding to know who wanted to start a poker game. An attendant led him suavely away to the bar. Gestures were shriller, bolder. The hard light drew lines and wrinkles and showed up splotches of powder on bare backs. No fog of smoke could eliminate the wet odor of the bar, or any amount of music blat down that insistent song of the wheel. They are fools, said Boncolin idly, to play against the double zero. He glanced over as another burst of laughter came from the tables. And the foreigners will play nothing else. Baccarat, chemin de fer, never. It must be quick, like a drink of whiskey. Voila! He snapped his fingers. Their only system is the martingale, doubles or quits, and they do not last long. Is the game straight? I asked. Oh, yes. Cheating is quite unnecessary and too dangerous. Well, he added, smiling, am I not showing you Paris, my friend Jack? And much obliged, except that I had hoped to go slumming. This is as dull and decorous as the Latin Quarter. Yes, but wait, Boncolin remarked softly. I seldom go anywhere for pleasure. I think you will find that this is no exception. A case? He shrugged his shoulders. For a time he sat staring with blank eyes at the crowd. Then he took out a black cigar and rolled it about in his fingers. Absently, he continued. It has been in the past my good or bad fortune to be concerned only in cases of an outlandish nature. Cases whose very impossible character admitted of just one solution. Cast your mind back. There was one way, and only one, in which the smuggler Mercier could have been strangled. There was one way for Lagarde to have been shot, and one way for Cyril Merton to have accomplished his disappearance. Is a person, then, to evolve a philosophy that there is but one way for any crime to be committed? Hardly. And yet, he scowled across the room. The Duc de Saligny, he went on abruptly, is good-looking, wealthy, and still young. He was married at noon today to a charming young woman. There, you will say, is a perfect cinema romance. The bride and groom are both here tonight. Indeed. Aren't they going on a wedding trip? To the modern marriage, mused Boncolin. There seems to be something slightly indecent about privacy. You must act in public as though you had been married twenty years, and in private as though you had not been married at all. That, however, is not my affair. There is a deeper reason for it. But they don't love each other, then. On the contrary, they seem to be violently in love. Have you ever heard of the bride? I shook my head. She was Madame Louise Laurent. Three years ago, she was married to a certain man named Alexandre Laurent. 
Shortly afterwards, her husband was committed to an asylum for the criminally insane. He was silent a moment, thoughtfully blowing smoke at the ceiling. Laurent was examined in a psychopathic ward. I was present at the time, and I give you my word that Cesare Lombroso would have been delighted with the case. He was a mild-appearing young man, soft-spoken and pleasant. The black spot on his brain was sadism. Usually lucid, he would have intervals in which the temptation to kill and mutilate became overpowering. And none of his crimes ever became known until after his marriage. Of course, such a neurosis could have no normal marriage and culminated in what is known as lust murder. He attacked his wife with a razor. She contrived to lock him in his room, for she is strong, and summoned help. By that time, the frenzy had spent itself, but his secret was out. Boncolin spread out his hands. A genius, Laurent, a scholar, a prodigy in the languages. He spent his days in the asylum very quietly, at study. The marriage, naturally, was annul. Boncolin paused, and then said slowly, Six months ago, he escaped from the asylum. He is at large today, and the confinement seems only to have unbalanced him more completely. What did he do? He set out to find a perfect disguise. In these days, my friend, they are childish who seek to disguise themselves with any stage trappings, paint or false air or anything of the kind. Even an unpracticed eye, such as your own, could penetrate such subterfuges without difficulty. No, Laurent did the only perfect thing. He put himself under the care of Dr. Grafenstein of Vienna, the greatest master of plastic surgery. He had himself remade entirely, even to his fingerprints. When this had been done, he quite coolly killed Dr. Grafenstein, the only person who had ever seen his new face. Even the nurse had never laid eyes on the patient. In the first stages, he was swathed in bandages. When he began to heal, he concealed himself in his own room. Yes, he killed Grafenstein. He is now in Paris. Two days ago, he wrote a letter to the young Duc de Saligny. It said simply, If you marry her, I will kill you. And I very much fear, my friend, that he will. I do not believe that I was ever in my life struck with so much horror as at this unemotional recital. Boncolin had never raised his voice. He smoked meditatively, watching the crowd. Out of his words there grew in my mind a distorted picture of a lunatic, a grand guignol madman stepping through green dusk. Boncolin turned his sardonic face, shook his head, and remarked, as though in response, No, we are not dealing with the conventional killer or the blood curdler who betrays himself in public. Have I not said that Laurent is mild-mannered and pleasant, only with that clot on his brain? And what does he look like? The good God knows. He may be that fat banker over at the roulette table, he may be the young American, or the croupier, or any of them. Or he may not be, and probably is not, here at all. But I shall not forget the Duc de Saligny's face when he brought that letter to me. A tall swaggerer, with bloodshot eyes and an excitable manner. He kept biting his lips and looking round until you could see the whites of his eyes. He was frightened, but he refused to admit it. Yes, he would go through with the wedding, and so would Louise. But you will see that he longs for public places now, until my men can step out and lay their hands on Laurent. 
That was the beginning of the nightmare drama. It seemed to me that the voices had grown more shrill, the gestures more elaborate, and that some force of Boncolin's words had penetrated to everybody in the room. It was not possible for them to have heard him, and yet you would have said that everyone was conscious of it and was looking over towards us furtively. Is he always dangerous? I asked. Any man who has committed one murder is always dangerous. And Laurent especially, for our pathological case has discovered how pleasant it can be. Well, how does Madame, Madame la Duchesse, take all this? Boncolin was regarding a very oily and effusive gambler who proclaimed his losses at the top of his voice. Then the detective laid his hand on my arm. You will see for yourself. Here she comes now. You notice? No emotion or agitation. She looks as though she were in a drug fog. A woman was crossing the room towards us. She moved in a rather vague way, with expressionless eyes and a slight smile. She was beautiful, but she was more than this. Even her hair had a cloudy look. The eyes were heavy-lidded and black, with not too much mascara, the lips of a sensual fullness which just escaped being coarse. In dress, she was perfect, the black gown accentuating the invitation of shoulder and breast. She twisted her pearls vaguely. There was a little silver anklet under the gray stocking. She came straight up to Boncola. When he bent over her hand, she was negligent, but closer. You could see a vein pulsing in her throat. Boncola introduced me and added, A friend of mine. You may speak freely. She looked towards me, and I had a sense of veils being drawn away. It was a look of scrutiny, not unmixed with suspicion. You are affiliated with the police, monsieur? She asked me. Yes, said Boncolin unexpectedly. She sat down, refused one of my cigarettes, and took her own from a little wrist bag. Leaning back, she inhaled deeply. Her hand trembled, and her lips stained the tip of the cigarette as though with blood. She wore some kind of exquisite perfume. One was conscious of her nearness. Monsieur le Duc is here? asked Boncolin. Raoul? Yes, Raoul is getting nervous, she answered, and laughed shrilly. I don't blame him, though. It is not a pleasant thing to think about, if you had ever seen Laurent's eyes. Boncolin raised his hand gently. She shivered a little, looked slowly over at me, and then said, There goes Raoul now into the card room. She nodded towards a broad back, disappearing through a door at the far end of the room. I saw no more than that, for I happened to be looking at my wristwatch. I looked at it twice, absently, before I noticed that the hour was 11.30. Orange blossoms, she said, and laughed again. Orange blossoms, lace veils, a lovely wedding, lovely bride, with even the clergyman staring at us and wondering if there were a madman in the church. Orange blossom, till death do you part. Death. Very possibly. This was sheer hysteria. The sights and sounds of the casino blended in with it. The banging of the jazz band became nearly unbearable. The voice of the croupier rose singing over it, like the bawling of a man who announces trains. Louise Duchesse de Saligny said abruptly, I want a cocktail. Don't mind me if I seem upset. I keep thinking of Laurent crawling about. Monsieur Boncolin, you are here to see that no harm comes to Raoul, you hear? Till death do you part. She shivered again. There was silence while Boncolin looked round for the boy with the cocktail tray. A silence and none of us intruded on each other's thoughts. 
A man and woman walked past us, almost stumbling over Madame's feet, and I recall that the man was saying heatedly, in English, Five hundred francs is entirely too damn much. The voices trailed away. Somebody had come up in front of us and coughed discreetly. It was a tall man, dapper, blonde, with an eyeglass and an almost imperceptible mustache. Your pardon, if I am intruding, he remarked. Louise, I don't believe I know. He took out his handkerchief unnecessarily, wiped his lips, and stood fidgeting. Oh, yes, she murmured. These are gentlemen from the police, Edouard. Allow me to present Monsieur Edouard Vautrel. Vautrel bowed, very happy. Raoul's gone to the card room, Louise. He's been drinking too much. Won't you play? That music, she suddenly snapped. Damn that music, I can't stand it, I won't stand it. Tell him to stop. Doucement, doucement. Vautrel urged, looking round in a nervous way. With an apologetic nod to us, he took her arm and led her towards the table. She seemed to have forgotten our existence. Boncolin picked up the cigarette stub she had left in the ashtray. He was juggling it in his palm, when suddenly he looked up. Madame and Vautrel were in the center of the room, directly under one of the large chandeliers. They stopped. We all heard the crash of breaking glass and saw the white-coated servant leaning against the door of the card room. He had let fall the tray of cocktails and was staring stupidly at the wreckage. Everyone turned to look. With the cessation of voices, the jazz band had stopped too. The manager, his fat stomach wobbling, was hurrying across the room. But most distinctly, emerged the drawn, shiny face of the servant, who had seen something and was desperately afraid. Bocolin did not seem to hurry, but he was across the room immediately. I was directly behind him. He extended in his palm for the manager's gaze the little card with the circle, the eagle, and the three words, Prefecture of Police. Together we went through the door of the card room. My sensations were the same as those I had experienced once at a sideshow, when I had seen some mountebank swallow a snake. The room was not well lit. Its leprous red walls were hung with weapons, and a red shaded lamp burned beside a divan at the far end. A man had fallen forward before the divan, as though in the act of kneeling. But the man had no head. Instead, there was a bloody stump propped on the floor. The head itself stood in the center of the room, upright on its neck. It showed white eyeballs and grinned at us in the low red light. A breeze through an open window blew at us a heavy, sweet smell. Part Two Red Footlights with the utmost coolness, Boncolin turned to the manager. Two of my men, he said, are on guard at your door. Summon them. All the doors are to be locked and nobody must leave. Keep them playing, if it is possible. In the meantime, come in yourself and lock this door. The manager stammered something to an attendant and added, Nobody is to know about this, understand? He was a fat man, who looked as though he were melting. A monstrous mustache curled up to his eyes, which bulged like a frog's. Tumbling against the door, he stood and pulled idiotically at his mustache. Boncolin, twisting a handkerchief over his fingers, turned the key in the lock. There was another door in the wall to our right, at the left side of the dead man as he lay before the divan. Boncolin went over to it. It was ajar, and he peered outside. This is the main hall, monsieur, he asked. Yes, said the manager. It, uh, it. Here is one of my men, 
Boncolin beckoned from the door and held a short consultation with the man outside. Nobody has come out there, he observed, closing the door. Francois was watching. Now. All of us were looking about the room. I tried to keep my eyes off the head, which appeared to be gazing at me sideways. The wind blew on my face, and it felt very cold. Boncolin walked over to the body, where he stood and peered down, smoothing his mustache. Beside the neck stump, I could see projecting from the shadow a part of a heavy sword. It had come apparently from a group on the wall, and though the edge was mostly dulled with blood, a part near the handle emerged in a sharp, glittering line. Butcher's work, said Boncolin, twitching his shoulders. See, it has been recently sharpened. He stepped daintily over the red soaking against the lighter red of the carpet and went to the window at our left. Forty feet from the street. Inaccessible. He turned and stood against the blowing curtains. The black eyes were bright and sunken. In them you could see rage at himself, nervousness, indecision. He beat his hands softly together, made a gesture, and returned to the body, where he avoided the blood by kneeling over the divan. Jack, he said suddenly, looking up, pick up the head and bring it over here. No doubt about it, I was growing ill. Pick up the head, did you say? Certainly. Bring it here. Watch out now. Don't get the blood on your trousers. In a daze, I approached the thing, shut my eyes, and picked it up by the hair. The hair felt cold and greasy, the head much heavier than I had thought. While I was going towards Boncolin, I recalled that the jazz band started playing again downstairs, dinning over and over. When cares pursue ya, sing hallelujah. I shouldn't tamper with this, Boncolin observed but nobody can give me orders. And I don't think we need a coroner's report about the manner of his death. He fitted the head against the trunk and stood back, frowning. I sat down heavily on the divan. Come here, monsieur, said Boncolin to the proprietor. This sword, it comes from the room here? The manager began talking excitedly. His syllables exploded like a string of little firecrackers popping over the room. The almost unintelligible clipped speech of the midi. Yes, the sword belonged here. It had hung with another, like itself, crossed over a Frankish shield on the wall near the divan. It was an imitation antique. Oh yes, it was razor sharp. This lent such a semblance of reality. And the patrons liked reality. To handle remarked the detective. He studied with round brass nail heads. We shall get no clear fingerprints from it, I fear. Do you ever use this room, monsieur? Oh, yes, frequently. But we haven't used it tonight. See, the card tables are folded against the wall. Nobody wanted to play. It was all that roulette. Volubly eager, the manager waggled his fat hands. Do you think it can be hushed up, monsieur? My trade! Do you know this dead man? Oh, yes, monsieur. It is monsieur le duc de Saligny. He often comes here. Did you see him go in here tonight? No, monsieur. The last I saw him was early in the evening. Was he with anybody then? With monsieur Edouard Vautrel. The two were great friends. Very good, then. You may go out now and inform Madame la Duchesse. Be as quiet about it as possible. Better take her out in the hall, in case she makes a scene. Tell Monsieur Vautrel to step in here. He went out by the hall door, leering over his shoulder with tiny, wrinkled eyes. Boncolin turned to me. Well, what do you make of it? I could not collect my thoughts, and blurted dully, they were fortunate to keep it from the crowd out there. No, no. The murder. 
It was a terrific blow. It must have taken a madman's strength. I wonder, said Boncolin, beginning to pace up and down. Not necessarily, my friend. It was a two-handed blow. But as our manager says, that sword is razor sharp. I do not think that such gigantic strength was essential. You could have done it yourself. Look at the position of the body. Does it convey nothing to you? Only that there seems to have been no struggle. Obviously not. He was struck from behind. We may assume that he was sitting on the divan before he was struck. But he got to his feet. Mark that. He got to his feet also before he was killed. You know that he is some distance out from the divan. Well, yes, there are a number of pillows on the divan. Pillows? Certainly. Great God, where are your wits? Don't you understand? Well, it suggests nothing except... except an amorous implication. Amorous the devil! snapped Boncolin. There was nothing amorous about the situation here. He laughed wryly and added, <laughs> Our madman is now in these gaming rooms. Nobody has left unless my agents were asleep. By the hall door. Francois has been there since 11.30. Do you know what time Saligny came in here? I recall exactly, because when Madame pointed him out, I was looking at my watch. It was 11.30. Boncolin looked at his own watch. Just twelve. It should be easy to check alibis. How do you account for the fact that the head lies at some distance from the body, standing up? But certainly couldn't have rolled to that position. Well, stranger things have happened, but it didn't. You can see that there is no blood trail between the head and the body. No. The murderer put it there. Why? You forget that this is no sane mind. Can't you imagine it? The murderer, triumphantly holding up the head of his victim, mocking it, addressing words to it, while he walked around shaking it by the hair. What a cheerful imagination you have. But it is necessary, he murmured, shrugging. Then he bent down gingerly and started to go through Saligny's pockets. Presently he straightened up and indicated a pile of articles on the divan. There was a queer smile on his face. The crowning touch. His pockets are filled with pictures of himself. Yes, see? He ran his hands through clippings and pasteboards. Newspaper pictures and a few cabinet photographs. Photographs of himself, every conceivable sort. Pictures where he looks handsome, pictures where he looks ghastly. Here is one on horseback, another at the golf links. Hmm. Nothing else except some banknotes, a watch, and a lighter. Why these photographs at all? And especially, why are they carried in evening clothes? Conceited ass! Boncolin shook his head. He was squatting by the divan, idly turning over the clippings. No, my friend, there may be another reason, which is the peak of all this odd business. Cabinet photographs. Diable! We were suddenly startled by a tearing, rattling sound. The door to the hall was pushed open despite a protesting officer in plain clothes. There lurched into the room a short, pudgy, wild-eyed young man with a paper hat stuck on the back of his head. He grinned foolishly. His clothes were awry, and the noise was being made by one of those wooden twirlers they give as favors at nightclubs. He gave that sort of drunken leer, very popular at weddings, shook the rattler at us, and smirked at the silly sounds it emitted. Party here, he said in English. Scort cobble home. Always do scort to the home, too, uh, uh, as it were. Let's have a drink. Got any liquor? he demanded interestedly of the plain-clothes man. Mais, monsieur, c'est défendu d'entrer. Cut a frog talk, no compré. Got any liquor, hein? Monsieur, je vous ai dit. Listen, gotta see my friend Raoul. He's married. Hell of a thing to do. 
The young man was pleading and persistent. I went over hurriedly and spoke in English. Uh, better go out, old top. You'll get to see him. By God, you're my friend, crowed the young man, opening his eyes wide and thrusting out his hand. Got any liquor? I've been drinking, he confided in a low tone. But gotta see Raoul. He's married. Let's have a drink. Suddenly he sat down in a chair near the door and fell into a half stupor, still twirling the rattle. Monsieur, cried the policeman. I'm gonna pop you, said the newcomer, opening his eyes again and pointing his finger at the policeman with a curiously intense look. Sure as hell, I'm gonna pop you if you don't get away. Come on, get back. I'm gonna pop him. He relapsed again. Who is this? I asked Boncola. I have seen him before, with Saligny, the detective replied. His name is Galton, or something of the sort. An American, naturally. We had better put him... Again, there was an interruption. We heard a woman moaning. I can't stand it, I can't stand it. And other feminine tones, urging her to be quiet. It was Madame Louise's voice. The door to the hall opened, and Edouard Vautrel entered. He was very pale, but supercilious. He polished the eyeglass on his handkerchief and looked round coldly. Was this necessary? he said. Supported by a little wizened woman attendant, Madame Louise came after him. She glanced at the thing on the floor. Then she stood, stoically, upright and motionless, with the rouge glaring out on her cheeks. Her eyes were dry and hot. There was a space of silence, so that we could hear the curtains rustling at the window. Suddenly Galton, the American, looked up from a glassy contemplation of the floor and saw her. He emitted a crow of delight, never noticing the body. He rose unsteadily, made a flamboyant bow, and seized Madame's hand. My heartiest congratulations, he said, on this the happiest day of your whole life. It was a ghastly moment. We all stood there frozen, except Galton, who was wobbling with hand extended in his bow. Galton's eyes traveled up to Vautrel, and he added waggishly, Sorry you got the gate, Eddie. Raoul's got more money in you anyhow. Part 3 Death Guides the Clocks Votrell snarled, Get set drunk and dog out of here, and made a movement that was restrained by Boncola. Take him out, the detective whispered to me, and added under his breath, Learn what you can. Galton was more easily led away by one of his nationality. Besides, at that moment he gave signs of becoming unwell. The policeman passed us out into the hall, and I supported him down its length to the men's lounging room, which was equipped with deep chairs and many ashtrays. Stoutly denying the need of assistance, he disappeared for a time, and presently emerged looking pale, but considerably more sober. Sorry to be such an inconvenience, he said, sinking into a chair. Can't hold it. All right now. After a time of staring at the floor, he said irritably, What's all a fuss about? Your friend, Raoul. Well, he's been married. I adopted the easy camaraderie of Americans in a strange country. Known him long? Two or three months. Met him when I was on a trip to Austria. He and his wife have been engaged a long time, haven't they? I'll say. Must be two years. I don't know what's been delaying them. Ever since I've been in France, I guess. S say, let me introduce myself. Sid Galton's the name from Nebraska. I think I could stand a drink. You were an intimate of his then. Not exactly, but I, I knew him pretty well. Way I met him, I saw his picture in the papers. Great horseman. So am I. Walked up on the train and says, I'm Sid Galton. I want to shake your hand. That was very tactful. Sure. Well, 
he spoke English, all right, but I never got a chance to go riding with him. Used to drop round to his house. It was a swell wedding they had. It suddenly penetrated Galton's mind that something was wrong. His face was assuming normal lines after a squashed clay appearance and resolved into pudgy, reddish features under thinning hair. He demanded, What's all this about, anyhow? Mr. Galton, I'm sorry to say that the Duc de Saligny has been murdered. Galton's eyes turned as glassy as marbles. He was halfway out of his chair when the door to the hall opened and Boncolin entered with Edouard Bautrel. The ensuing few minutes showed Galton, maudlin and fearful, grotesque with his scared features under the paper cap, insisting that he didn't know a damn thing about it, and if he wasn't let out of there right away, there'd be trouble, because he was a sick man. You are at liberty to go, of course, Boncolin said. But please, leave your address. Galton blundered out the door, loudly declaring that he was headed for Harry's New York bar. His address he gave as 324 Avenue Henri Martin. Sit down, please, Monsieur Vautrel, Boncolin requested. Vautrel was the essence of coolness. His shirt front did not bulge when he sat down. The wings of his white tie were exactly in line. Even the colorless face had no wrinkles, but the movements of his eyes jarred it in quick darts. He crossed one leg over the other in a bored way. A few questions, please, uh, monsieur. You understand that uh, this is necessary. Vautrel inclined his head. May I ask the last time you saw Monsieur de Saligny alive? I can't recall the exact hour. It may have been ten o'clock. Where was he then? He had just left Louise with some of her feminine friends. He was going towards the tables. He seemed in high spirits. I'm going to play the red, Edouard, he cried. Red is my lucky color tonight. I could have sworn that there was a faint smile on Vautrel's face. Then, Vautrel continued, he turned to me as though with an afterthought. By the way, he said, what was that cocktail you were describing to me, the one the man makes in the American bar at the ambassador? I told him. Well, then, do me a favor, will you, he said. Get hold of the bar steward here and tell him to mix me a shaker of them, will you? I'm expecting a man on something very important tonight. And, oh, yes, while you're there, you might tell him to bring it to the card room when I ring. I expect the man about 11.30 o'clock. Thanks. I rejoin some friends. One moment, please, interposed Boncolin. He pulled the bell cord at his elbow. Presently, there entered the white-coated servant who had dropped the tray on entering the room of the murder. He was freckled and ill at ease, and his huge hands tugged at the bottom of his jacket. Boncolin, standing with one elbow on the mantelpiece, extended his hand. Steward, you were the person who discovered the dead man? he asked. Yes, monsieur. Monsieur there, he nodded towards Vautrel had told me to expect a ring around 11.30 from the card room, and I took in the cocktails monsieur had ordered. I saw... His eyes wrinkled up, and he protested. I could not help breaking those glasses, monsieur. Really, I could not. If you will speak on my behalf to... Never mind the glasses. You heard the bell ring, then. At what time was this? At about half past eleven. I know, because I was watching the clock for it. Monsieur de Saligny always tips. Tipped. Well. Where were you at the time? In the bar, monsieur. Where is the bell cord in the card room? Oh, by the door into the main hallway, monsieur. You may see for yourself. You came immediately. Not immediately. The bar steward took his time about mixing the cocktails and insisted that I wash some sherbet glasses. It must have been ten minutes before I answered the ring. By which door did you enter? 
by the door into the hallway. It is closer to the smoking room on which the bar gives. The light in the card room was bad, and when I entered, I got no reply to my knock. He began to speak very fast and shift his glance from side to side. I did not at first perceive the... that anything was wrong. I... Oh, Mère de Dieu! I walked across and almost stumbled over the head. I cried out. I reached the door of the main salon, and I could hold my tray no longer. That is all, monsieur. I swear to you before all... He fidgeted and backed towards the door. Abruptly, not at all muffled by the closed door, the orchestra downstairs commenced again on another ancient tune which had just come to Paris. A throaty voice warbled in English, Pack up all my care and woe, here I go, singing low. Boncolin turned his back and stood for a time looking out of the window. Then he motioned the steward to go. He returned to the table beside which Vautrel sat bolt upright with an amused smile. Here, he said, sketching rapidly and tearing out a leaf of his notebook, is a rough plan of the floor. I have consulted the clocks in the smoking room and on the staircase. They agree with my watch that it is now... What hour have you, Monsieur Vautrel? Vautrel turned over a thin silver watch in his palm. He consulted it with great deliberation and announced, Exactly, twenty-five minutes past twelve. To the second, agreed Boncola. He turned to me. Uh, you have uh, twenty-four and a half minutes to the second. Boncolin scowled at the plan. Very well. To proceed, Monsieur Vautrel, can you tell me your whereabouts at half past eleven when Monsieur de Saligny entered the card room? Within a few seconds, Monsieur, I can. Vautrel hesitated. Then, startlingly, he burst into a roar of laughter. I was speaking to your detective on guard at the end of the hall, and I stayed with him for over five minutes. When I walked into the main salon, under his observation, and was introduced to you. Boncola nearly lost his temper. After an interval of silence, during which he stared at Bottrell, he yanked the bell cord. Francois, the plainclothes detective, came in with an air of importance, rubbing his large nose. Why, yes, monsieur. The gentleman there was with me, he replied. I was sitting in a chair reading La Sourire when he came up to me and offered me a cigarette and said, Can you by any chance tell me the right time? My watch seems to be slow. I am positive, said I, that my watch is right. Eleven-thirty. However, we can consult the clock on the staircase. Francois refreshed himself with a glance at all of us. He resumed. We walked to the head of the stairs, and as I knew, the clock confirmed my watch. He set his own, and we stood there talking. So, interrupted Boncolin, that you were directly before the hall door into the card room, within a minute after Monsieur de Saligny entered the room from the gaming salon. Oh, yes. We stayed there over five minutes. And then Monsieur there walked down the hall and entered the main salon. I remained at the head of the stairs. Incidentally, I saw the boy go in with the tray. You are positive, then? that nobody left by the hall door. Positive, monsieur. That is all. Boncolin sat at the table with his chin in his hands. After a time, Vautrel remarked, Of course, you are at liberty to imagine that there has been tampering with clocks. There has been no tampering with the clocks, nor with my friend's watch, nor with mine. I have made certain of that. Then I suppose that I am at liberty to go. I dare say Madame needs attention, and I shall be glad to take her home. Where is Madame now? In the ladies' room, I believe, with an attendant. I presume, observed Boncolin with a crooked smile, that you will not take her to the home of Monsieur de Saligny. 
Botrell appeared to take the question seriously. He put the glass in his eye and answered, No, of course not. I shall take her to the apartment she occupied previously, in the Avenue du Bois. In case you want my address, he extracted a card case. Here is my card. I shall be pleased to present you with a duplicate. At any time in the future you feel called on to be as insulting as you have tonight. He preened himself as he rose, and his manner said, There's no reply to that. Standing in the doorway, he called for his wraps. Boncolin, thoughtfully turning the card over in his fingers, looked up with wrinkled forehead. Saligny was a great swordsman, too, I take it, he said softly. Tell me, Monsieur Vautrel, did he speak English? Raoul? That is the most amusing question yet. Raoul was essentially a sportsman and nothing else. Yes, he was a swordsman and a spectacular tennis player. He had a serve that nearly stopped Lacoste, and the best of steeplechase riders. Oh, of course, Vautrel added smugly. He did sustain a fall that nearly paralyzed his wrist and spine, and he had to see a foreign specialist about it. But yes, he was a fine athlete. Books he never opened. Tiens, Raoul speaking English. The only words he knew were five o'clock tea. A servant had brought in Vautrel's coat, long and dark, with a great sable collar, and hooked with a silver chain. It was like a piece of stage property. He pulled down on his head a soft black hat, and the monocle gleamed from its shadow. Then he produced a long ivory holder, into which he fitted a cigarette. Standing in the doorway, tall, theatrical, with the holder stuck at an angle in his mouth, he smiled. You will not forget my card, Monsieur Boncola? Since you force me to it, said Boncola, shrugging, I must say that I would much prefer to see your identity card, Monsieur. Vautrel took the holder out of his mouth which is your way of saying that I am not a Frenchman? You are a Russian, I believe. That is quite correct. I came to Paris ten years ago. I have since taken out citizenship papers. Ah. Oh. And you were? Major, Fedorf Battalion, Ninth Cossack Cavalry in the Army of His Imperial Majesty the Tsar. Mockingly, Vautrel clicked his heels together, bowed from the hips, and was gone. Part 4. Hashish and Opium Boncalin looked across at me and raised his eyebrows. Alibi, baby, I said. I don't see how you're going to shake it, Boncalin. For the present it is not necessary that I should. Question. Where does this species of fire-eater get the income to go about with a millionaire like Saligny? But you suspect that he is our madman? Frankly, I don't. But I very much suspect that he has been in the habit of supplying Madame la Duchesse with drugs. Drugs? When she came over to us this evening, went on Boncola, hunching up in the chair, I remarked that she looked as though she were in a drug fog. I did not know it at the time, but that was the literal truth. Did you see me pick up the cigarette she left in the ashtray near us? He fished it out of his vest pocket. It is very thoroughly doctored, with what I can't say until our chemists analyze it. It is either marijuana, the Indian hemp plant, the Mexicans use its dried leaves as a cigarette filler, or the Egyptian hashish. She is a confirmed user, or it would have made her violently ill. You notice the expression of her eyes and the wildness of her conversation. She is no novice in its use. Some say it kills, you know, within five years. Somebody is most earnestly trying to do away with her. He was silent, tapping the pencil against the table. 
and because I was busy forming a theory, I made no comment. He viewed the case with sardonic eyes, sour and unsurprised. Well, I want to speak to one other person, he said at length. Then we shall have to go on a little errand I have in mind. Francois, send the proprietor in. The gentleman came in, wild-eyed, his moustache drooping like a dog's ears. Monsieur, he cried, before his stomach had preceded him through the door. I beg of you, you must count the men that order that nobody is to leave. Several have tried to go, and your men downstairs stopped them. They demanded to know why. I said it was a suicide. There are reporters. Sit down, please. You need not worry. A suicide will enhance the reputation of your establishment. Is the medical examiner here? He has just arrived. Good. Now, before coming here this evening, I consulted the files for some information about you. It is a lie, of course. Of course, agreed Boncolin, composedly. Chiefly, I wanted to know if there are any patrons here tonight who are unknown to you. None. One must have a card to enter, and I investigate them all, unless, of course, it is the police. I should be grateful if my compliment to you were returned. He was drawn up in offended dignity, rather like a laundry bag attempting to resemble a gold shipment. Boncolin's pencil clicked regularly against the table. Your name, I am informed, is Luigi Fenelli, not a common patronymic in France. It is true that some years ago the good Signor Mussolini objected to your running an establishment for the purpose of escorting weary people through the gate of the Hundred Sorrows? Briefly, monsieur, were you ever arrested for selling opium? Fenelli lifted his arms to heaven and swore by the blood of the Madonna, the face of St. Luke, and the bleeding feet of the apostles that such a charge was infamous. You give good authority, said the detective thoughtfully. Nevertheless, I am inclined to be curious. Does it require a card, for example, to be admitted to the fourth floor of this establishment? Or is the soothing poppy dispensed, like the cocktails, by the courtesy of the house? Fenelli's voice raised to a shout. Boncolin's hand silenced him. Please, said the detective. The information was mine before I came here. I give you twelve hours to throw into the sand whatever shipment you have on hand. This leeway I grant you on one condition, that you answer me a question. Even the illustrious Garibaldi, said the other dramatically, was sometimes forced to compromise. I deny your charge, but as a good citizen I cannot refuse to assist the police with any information at my command. How long has Monsieur le Duc de Saligny been a user of opium? Don't deny it. He has been known to come here. Well, then, within the last month, monsieur, I was shocked and grieved that such a fine young man, no doubt, no doubt, did the woman who is now his wife contract any charming habits here also? Each, replied the manager loftily, was very much concerned about concealing it from the other. Ah, yes. Who instigated this? You asked her for one question, Monsieur Boncolin, and I have answered you two. That is all I will tell you if they subject me to torture. Such a contingency is hardly likely. At any rate, I advise you become busy turning your fourth floor into a bar or a bagno or something equally harmless. That is all, Fenelli. When the manager had gone, I looked up from an ostentatious studying of the floor plan and said, May I ask how much of your information you're concealing, Boncolin? This was the first mention of that angle. Cellini is a drug taker? Ah, but that's another pair of sleeves completely. I was not sure it had any bearing on the case. 
Now I am morally certain it has. How did you learn about Fenelli's private parlor on the fourth floor? Saligny told me about it. Saligny told you about it? You don't mean Saligny, do you? Yes, with an injured and virtuous air. Jack, find me a person in this whole affair who is acting rationally, and I'll make you chief of detectives. Now, in a moment, we shall be invaded by the whole horde. I hear screamings and protestings out there, and I want you to accompany me on an expedition I have in mind. But first, let us argue the case a bit. I am curious to get a layman's reaction. He rose and began to pace about, hands clasped behind his back, head bent forward. Mephistopheles smoking a cigar, several of him reflected in the mirrors around the walls as he passed up and down a queer and absurd little figure in motion. But Paris is avenger of broken laws. You want me to name the man I think is Laurent? I inquired. Hmm, that would be deducing from insufficient evidence at this stage of the game. You have not seen everybody here, nor one-fifth of the people who might be Laurent. I imagine that all our characters have not yet appeared. But proceed. You think you know the man who killed Saligny? The chances are I'm wrong, naturally, but I'll have a guess. Well? The American, Galton. Boncolin stopped abruptly and removed the cigar. Tiens, this is interesting. Why? Do you have reasons, or are you guessing detective story fashion? I give them to you for what they're worth. Reason number one, Galton's behavior. It doesn't ring true. It's overdone. It's a little too American. That byplay in the card room, for example. It doesn't seem possible that any man, no matter how drunk, should fail to notice such a shambles directly before him. An American should be the best judge of that, I confess. Still, the servant seems to have walked halfway across the room without... I wonder. Uh, no matter. Go on. His behavior, then. He sobered up remarkably fast, too, after telling that bit about Vautrel being cut out by Saligny in Madame's affections. Reason number two. He says he met Saligny when he was returning from Austria. I may point out that it was from Vienna that Laurent escaped. If he is Laurent. He would be a lunatic indeed to tell you that voluntarily. Austria, moreover, has several cities besides Vienna. Reason number three. According to every bit of evidence we have, Saligny could not speak English. Yet according to what Galton told me, we have him speaking English quite well. More than that, we have Galton, who says he speaks no French, going about constantly with a man who speaks no English. How is that to be explained? Touche, said Boncolin, snapping his fingers. You score there, certainly. Galton seems to have slipped up in that respect. However, it is hardly an indication that he is the murderer. You yourself have told me that Laurent is a genius as a linguist. Certainly, if Galton is Laurent, He's amazingly adept with the idiom. Now let us carry this on. What is Galton's procedure? How is he contrived to kill Saligny? Well, let me ask a question. Do you subscribe to the theory that Laurent, in whatever guise, killed Saligny? Most emphatically, yes. Proceed. He might very well have been the man whom Saligny proposed to entertain. He might, of course. Which way did he go into the card room? By either door. He might have been there early. Yes, now let me ask you. Boncolin suddenly leaned across the table and pointed his cigar. Which way did he go out? During the silence, while the detective stood motionless, I realized the significance of that remark. 
and I swore at myself for dropping into the trap. But there was a chasm at our feet much wider than this. The murderer, I said slowly, did not go out by the hall door. Because my detective was standing directly before it a few seconds after Saligny entered the room from the salon side, and he did not leave it until after the murder was committed. And the murderer did not go out by the other door into the salon, because I myself was watching it from the time Saligny entered to the time we ourselves went in. In other words, we have a locked room situation, worse than any I have ever encountered, since I myself can swear nobody came out one door, and one of my most trusted men swears that nobody came out the other. Still he did not move, but he looked as haggard as a man crucified. I wondered, he said in a low voice, how long it would take you to see that situation. It doesn't seem to have occurred to these people even now. I examined the window immediately, you remember. Forty feet above the street. No other windows within yards of it. The walls smooth stone. No human fly in existence could have entered or left that way. No place in the room for a cat to hide. I searched for that, too. No possibility of false walls, for you can stand in any door and see the entire partition of the next room. Tear open floor or ceiling, and you will find only the floor or ceiling of another room. That way is blocked. Yet we know, in this of all cases, that the dead man did not kill himself. It is the master puzzle of them all. He turned round and slouched across to the window, bent shoulders silhouetted against a faint glow from the street. There was a clamor of excited voices in the hall, hands thudded at the door. I cried, Boncolin, and leaped up. Boncolin, do you realize? The boy who brought the cocktails, the only one who could have been in the room alone with Saligny, hired by Fanelli to kill the informer. I was so excited that I did not at first understand his wry smile. Likewise impossible, Jack, he answered softly. Did you not hear him? How he protested that he could not help dropping the tray. How he kept his hands along the bottom of his jacket. Did you not notice? The fingers of his right hand were amputated long ago. Part 5. The Trunk from Vienna It was two o'clock when Boncolin and I left the house. Sounds through sharp, brittle echoes in the cul-de-sac of the Rue des Eaux. There was a thin mist, and a wind blew from the river in the raw spring moonlight. The tops of apartment houses were drawn against the sky as on glass, and a few windows were alight against their black walls. The rumble of a metro train swelled out of its tunnel and passed on the trestle over the Rue Beethoven. Distantly, you could hear the motor of a cruising taxi. Moncola's car was parked not far from the Avenue de Tokyo. He had not spoken for some time, and when he climbed in at the wheel, I asked, Incidentally, where are we going? Put your hand down in the pocket of the door there, he said. What do you find? It appears to be the handle of a rather heavy pistol. Precisely. Put it in your pocket. Do you still want to go? Delighted, if I can contrive to hit anything. That was all I wanted to know. The thing isn't loaded. Put it back where you found it. When he'd got the engine started, he tapped his breast pocket. This one, he added absently, is loaded. We turned into the Avenue de Tokyo, a vast plain with the parapet lamps of the river marching away in curved lines to the right. Beyond them, the high fretwork of the tower was printed spider black against the moonlit sky. The river breeze smelled of rain. Boncolin's big voisin 
roared past the Pont d'Iena, and one had a sensation as of wings. At length he volunteered, We are going to the home of the Duc de Saligny. Oh, then why the gun parade? That isn't dangerous, is it? I have reason to believe that there are things in his house which a certain somebody will be very anxious to remove, if that person doesn't get there before us. The address, by the way, is number 326 Avenue Henri Martin, which means, he looked sideways, that our friend Galton lives next door. But you have pretty well exploded my theory of the murder. Pardon, I didn't say you were wrong. I said we must examine the evidence from all sides. He relapsed into silence. I sat back and closed my eyes. From Paris you can get no distant vibration, no far heavy rumble of traffic such as one hears in London. When the siren of the flying car screamed, horns picked it up and answered as from a gulf. There was the rattle of a late tram in the pale glitter of the Place de l'Alma. We swerved to the left up the hill, and presently the grey arch dawned among hooting taxis. A few drops of rain blurred the windshield, and the head of Saligny floated against the dark. The wan sheen of thoroughfares dwindled away. We were in a street of trees where the headlights showed flashes of budding green, but a black arch devoid of movement. Before the gate of 326, we stopped. Twin globes of light burned yellow on either side and shone on the dark windows of the concierge's lodge. Boncolin's fingers clicked a tattoo against the glass. Sieur et dame, said a sleepy voice inside. My felicitations. When the iron gate swung back, we were looking into the sleepy face of a woman in curl papers. The concierge was about to dart back in alarm when Boncolin intervened. Prefecture of police, I must ask you to admit us. He received the key from the babbling woman and ordered her back into the lodge. We could hear her wailing. Murdered! Murdered! I knew it! Wake up, Jules! Be silent! Boncolin snarled over his shoulder. Fitting the key into the lock of the house door, he whispered, There are no servants here. If I find anybody prowling, it will be necessary to shoot. We entered a dark hallway which smelled of flowers. I could hear Boncolin's steady breathing. He guided my arm across towards the vast curve of a stairway, down whose railing moonlight shone from a window. A rug slipped under my foot on the hardwood floor. We reached the top of the staircase. Boncolin turned, cloaked and weird against the moonlight. He nodded toward a door at the other end of the second floor. There was a thread of light under the sill. When he put his right hand softly on the knob of that door, his left was inside his breast pocket. He threw the door back. A man sprang round to face us. He was standing in the middle of a room fully lighted, though the shutters were up. There was a great canopied bed nearby, and you noticed at its head a woman's blue fur-trimmed slippers. The man was small, with thick red hair, and when his mouth opened in surprise, it disclosed many missing teeth. He had the cut of an overweight athlete. Boncolin closed the door. Hello, Gira, he said. I had hardly expected to find you here. Turn out those lights and lower your voice. Monsieur Boncola. Quiet. What are you doing here? I am the Monseigneur's most personal servant, said the man called Gira. He wagged his head and grinned proudly. I have been with him for over a month. I was preparing the bridal. He leered and rubbed his hands. Boncolin whistled. He gestured towards Girard. Formerly, he explained, the hero of Auteuil, a jockey I have put my money on in preference to the horse. 
Madame de Trèfle. Three to one. Girard up. What overweight, monsieur? I've been out of the game for some time. See! He lifted a tawdry affair of red roses, shaped like a horseshoe, and inscribed in white roses with the legend, Bon Chance. My tribute. It brings good luck. Boncolin stared at him speculatively. You're up late, Girard. Oh, yes, but, monsieur, why are you here? I want you to turn out those lights. Then tell me about your new position. The room went dark. The puzzled, suspicious Girard hung the wreath around his neck and stood gesturing in a vague glow from over the transom. Why, monsieur, I do not understand this. But whatever Monsieur Boncolin says, I will do without question. I used to know Monsieur de Saligny in the old days. Once I rode his filly, Drapeau Bleu. But then you know how it is. I could not make the weight. Rubber suits, blankets, diet, roadwork. Still, I could not make 46. You know... No, no. I went to Marseille. At last, in that despair, you know... I returned. I sought out Monsieur de Saligny, but of course he did not remember me. A bit of work around the stables, Monsieur, I pleaded. Ah, Girard, he said, you speak like a man of education, though not of intelligence. Can you use a typewriter and give my stable a workout if I'm not able to do so? But certainly, Monseigneur, I say. I have hurt myself, he explained and I went into a frenzy of grief. Monseigneur, the great horseman! I cannot use my hand well. Therefore, I shall dictate my correspondence. Et puis, voilà! He drew a long breath. And this lady that he has married, I would die for her. She's so lovely. If anyone sought to... The sentimental soul paused. Boncola inquired, Monseigneur had much correspondence? Oh, yes, he is very prominent, and he receives many things. That trunk! You can see how everyone likes him. What trunk? Why, the trunk that arrived two days ago. It was comical, you know. He had been in Vienna, and when he sent on his trunks, one was misdirected. It wandered about from one address to another and was returned to his hotel in Vienna. It had no name on it, but they recognized it, like that. There came a snapping of Girard's fingers. And they sent it on to him. Where is it now? Why, in his study. Boncolin said very slowly, Is it possible? There was a silence among the night creakings of the house. The horror of an unknown thing jumped back to a vital force when we heard the tone of his next words. Jiwa, don't ask any questions. Do exactly as I tell you. Go to your room now, and whatever happens, don't stir out of it. There is, or will be, somebody in this house. Who, oh, monsieur? A killer, said the detective. He opened the door softly. Against the faint moonlight, I could see that he had a pistol in his hand. Part 6 White Roses for Murder I felt a sickly, empty sensation around my stomach when we went up another flight of stairs towards Saligny's study, whose location Boncolin seemed to know very well. Stand in the door, he whispered. I want to see that the shutters are up. There was a space when I stood with my back to the hallway and heard Boncolin lightly trying the windows. The study smelt stuffy, and there was another queer odor. He returned presently, took off his cloak, and when he closed the door behind him, he laid the cloak along the bottom of the door. Now, turn on that lamp at your elbow. Keep your hand on the button, and if you hear any movement anywhere, shut it off. It was a dull lamp, with a globed shade set in green glass, 
and its light made crooked shadows in a small room hung with pictures. Beside the door was a large trunk, on which I sat down to watch the detective. Hmm, he muttered, talking fast and in a low voice. Dozens of sports pictures, himself with silver cups. Ascot, Longchamp, Wimbledon, amateur fencing team. Fine stag's head, that. Yes, and big game, gun case, Manchurian leopards. That racket needs restringing. He was walking about, glancing at this and that, picking up articles and laying them down, powerful, imbued with terrific, wiry energy. The table in the middle of the room claimed his attention. Typewriter. What's this? Books. Open here. Drawers are filled with them. The works of Edgar Allan Poe, Barbie d'Orvilly, Diabolique, odd fare for a sporting man, Baudelaire, Hoffman, La Vie de Gilles de Ray. He closed one book with a snap. That settles it. The idea I had in my mind seemed too outlandish and appalling. But I suddenly got up. We stood face to face, and by the expression of his eyes, I could see we both knew. The man, I said slowly, who for the past two months has been posing as the Duc de Saligny, is in reality. Laurent himself, supplied Boncola. Laurent, a master of irony. Laurent, with an eye to what he thinks is poetic justice. Over a year ago, the engagement of the Duc de Saligny to Madame Louise was announced in every newspaper of Europe. There were a hundred pictures of Saligny to draw from. He had the plastic surgeon make him into such a perfect image of Saligny that Madame Louise herself does not even now know the difference. I have never encountered such an artistic cutthroat. He planned and succeeded in marrying her a second time. And tonight, in that room downstairs, he would have avenged himself if somebody had not discovered it. In one blinding glare, every piece of contradiction showed up as one perfect whole. Boncolin, leaning across the desk, checked off the points on his fingers. First, we have Saligny taking a trip to Vienna two months or so ago. When he leaves, he is the master sportsman, rider, swordsman, hunter, tennis player, but a not overbright individual who rarely reads a printed line and speaks no language but his own. When he returns, he has unaccountably acquired an excellent knowledge of English, such that one of his closest companions is an American who speaks no French. His whole character changes. He does not ride, play tennis, or indulge in any sports whatever. Even sports where his injury would not prevent him. He refuses, because he no longer knows how. He is another man. Instead, he takes to opium smoking. He hires a jockey whom he does not recognize, although that jockey formerly rode his best horse to inspect his stables for him. He hires this man to take dictation, because otherwise his handwriting would be recognized as not that of the man he is impersonating. He cultivates a new circle of friends, witness Galton, and goes in for the life of the boulevard. Yet here, as the marked books of this man who never reads, we have volumes in three languages, and of a sort which shows an entire change of mind. The detective shrugged. Yes, that is the way I read it. He intended, of course, to come to Paris and do away with Saligny here. But by a circumstance fortunate for him, Saligny did go to Vienna, where somehow Laurent got into his hotel, and I very much suspect that the trunk on which you are sitting contains the body of the real Saligny. I was no longer sitting on it. I had backed away and in the weird green light, the thing explained, possibly, that odor. Bancola, I said, and with a calm not very convincing. The trunk 
is unlocked. Chance tripped him up. Yes, you see what he did? The detective was rambling on. He sent the trunk to a false address to be rid of it, he thought, and make another trunk murder to baffle the police. But the trunk came back, and the manager of the hotel, recognizing it, shipped it on to... The trunk is unlocked, I repeated monotonously. And then I reached down and threw open the lid. Boncolin came over swiftly. It was nearly full of sawdust. Sawdust tossed about as though something very heavy had been removed from its packings. There were brown stains streaked through the mass. Laurent removed the body before he was married, I said. But what are you doing? The detective's head was bent down into the trunk. No, Jack. This sawdust on top is damp and fresh. It came from the bottom of the trunk. The body was disturbed more recently than that. Probably tonight. For a moment, he let the sawdust run through his fingers. Don't you see? We are dealing with a man much more dangerous than Laurent himself, whom this man killed. We have found out about Laurent, but we are still at the beginning of the riddle. It is even less explicable now than it was before, for we have no madman on which to settle a motiveless crime. Who is the man, then? You seem to... Turn off that light! I reached over, fumbling, and switched it off. For a time, there was absolute silence. Then a faint creak as Boncolin eased open the door. Against the lesser darkness, I could see his dim shape, motionless in the aperture. From the chasm below, I thought I could hear a faint rasping noise, as of a shovel scraped over stone. Boncolin's figure moved forward soundlessly. I edged out beside him, planting my steps to avoid creaky boards. Again he stopped. Somewhere, a person was treading on stairs. There was the pale oblong of the window at the stairhead and dull moonlight on the pattern of a carpet. So slowly we edged towards those stairs that the window grew on one's vision, like a scene viewed through shortening opera glasses. He bent down when we reached the window, bent down and peered around the newel post, and I through the balustrades. Darkness but the footsteps were coming up the second flight of stairs. They hesitated on the second floor and crept round to the third. Suddenly, switched into our faces, was the glare of a flashlight. Holy man! Uncle I fired two shots, very deliberately, into the beam of the light. Their flat bang was like the burst of an explosion. The light vanished, and the footsteps thudded in leaps down the other flight of stairs. I stumbled, brought my hand in numbing contact with the stair wall, and blundered down into the dark, down to the first floor. There was a crash as a door was flung open, and other running footsteps joined the first. We heard a blubbering cry. Somehow, I found myself trembling, unable to speak, leaning on a table in the lower hall. When the lights came on, I blinked. The lights swam and came into slow focus. Boncolin stood near the switch, the fingers of his hand crooked before his face, breathing heavily. In the center of the Aubusson carpet, Girard lay on his back with a knife driven through his side. His oyster eyeballs rolled, and he gurgled through brimming lips when he tried to move his head. His arms were thrown wide, fingers picking at the carpet, and one leg was drawn up as though in an attempt to rise. Around his neck was still a crumpled horseshoe of red roses, which framed his head with the white inscription, Good Luck. Part 7. All Through the Night At four o'clock a.m., the events of this amazing night were over, at least so far as the butcheries were concerned. But for Boncolin, the work was just beginning. I never saw him so upset as at this latest development, the murder of Girard by the Prowler. 
His hand shook when he telephoned the prefecture. He cursed himself in a low, bitter monotone, like a man praying, and he cursed Girard for not following his advice. As nearly as it could be reconstructed, Girard had retired to his room on the ground floor. When he heard the shots, he came from the back of the house, saw the intruder running down the stairs, and interfered at the cost of his life. Boncolin's bullets had apparently taken no effect. Both were buried in the floor, one having shattered the flashlight and the other nicking the newel post about three feet from the floor. From the remnants of the flashlight, a long tungsten with a head much broader than the barrel, it was clear that the bullet had pierced the reflector without even grazing the hand of the man who had held it. In the cellar, we found the reason for the sound we had heard. Fresh mortar between the bricks behind a pile of debris and a trowel concealed under some straw led to the discovery of a hollow. Inside, a body was doubled up, horribly decomposed, but recognizable as that of Saligny. Laurent, it seemed, was not the only person in the case who had read well in the works of Poe. The knife with which Girard had been stabbed had first been used to pry out the loose bricks. Bits of dust and mortar still clung to the underside of the haft. After the murder, the assassin had gone out of the cellar door by which he had entered. To this day, I can see Boncolin holding up a lantern as he looked into the ghastly hollow behind the bricks. The chill damp of the cellar, the wind banging the open door, the rat that scurried past my foot. They are details indelible. When we left the house at four o'clock in possession of the police, Boncolin gave his last instructions. Above all, give nothing out to the press. I do not think you will find fingerprints, for the handle of the knife is dusty and has prints of what seem to be gloves. But make the test. I will phone in an hour. And then he said to me, We will go to my rooms and get coffee. Do you mind driving? I want to study this. Oh, Avenue Georges V. If you're not sure of the way, get back to the Champs-Élysées and then you can't miss it. On the return drive, he sat, strained forward, head between his hands, staring at nothingness. We know hardly more than before, I murmured. He turned savagely. Yes? You say that to me? I tell you I know the whole devilish plan. I know the height of the murderer and that he wore evening clothes. I know when he came and why he came. I know the reason he tried to come upstairs and what his connection was with Saligny. In short, I can draw you a picture of Girard's assassin. But, well, that is to be seen. Our organization is a devilfish, which can extend a thousand arms. And according to natural history, can throw out from itself a quantity of dense black liquid to obscure the view. Peste! You needn't snap. And your hands are trembling on that wheel. Well, it's an ordeal to turn anyone's stomach. We shall both need brandy. Turn to the right here. Between weariness and the horror of recollection, we exchanged no more words. Boncolin's rooms were in an apartment building not far from the American church. He kept such irregular hours that he had his own key, and we did not rouse the concierge at the front door. The automatic elevator made a slow ascent to the sixth floor. My servant, Boncolin explained, never knows when I shall be here. There is always coffee on the stove and a fire in the study. It was a formal apartment, stiff and luxurious in a stereotyped fashion, with the customary mirrors and Louis Kahn's furniture, all except the study, a tiny balcony, books to the ceiling, and a fire. Certainly the most untidy room I have ever seen. There were great padded chairs with inclined backs before the fireplace. A letter had been thrown down carelessly on the hearth, beside a tabouret with brandies and cigars. And the first sentence of the letter caught my eye. 
de la part de sa majesté, le roi d'Angleterre. « Clean off that chair and sit down, » said Boncolin. He began to sweep a pile of debris from the neighborhood of the hearth. A flutter of red fell from it, and I said, « My lord, man, be careful. That's the ribbon of the Legion of Honor. I know it, he returned irritably. Make yourself comfortable. Presently I fell into a doze and vaguely heard him fuming at something in the kitchen. The prospect of the evening danced in my brain, became linked with a crazy jingle. Heads and knives, swords and wives, how many are going, Tucson? And there swam across it the vision of Vautrell, polishing his monocle, of the flashlight in our faces. I stirred and opened my eyes. Boncolin was sitting across the hearth in one of the great chairs, with the firelight on his sardonic face. He pointed to a cup of coffee at my elbow. In a moment, he said, you are going to hear the prefecture in action. This, he tapped a telephone beside him, is my private wire. There is another phone on that table at your left. Push the books away. There. Listen to them. Now. Both of us picked up the phones. Hello, he said. Bureau Central. Bon Colin, speaking. There was a prolonged clicking. Bureau Central, a voice answered. Dolores Laboratory, please. I want the reports on the Saligny case. Have they finished? To eleven, speaking, said another voice. Report as follows. There are no clear fingerprints due to the brass nail heads on the handle of the sword. An identification is impossible. There are several prints on the glass of the window, but they do not correspond to any in our files. The dust of the carpet and that of the cover on the divan has been swept up. The glass here sits out nothing but cigarette ashes, mud traces, and a few grains of candy. Have these been analyzed? Not yet. There will be a report by morning as to whether the ashes are of the same quality as those of the cigarette submitted. This cigarette contains hashish. Very good. Shift me to the general office 113. 113 speaking? You followed the American, Galton, from Passy? Yes. He took a taxi to Harry's New York bar, Boulevard des Italiens. He remained there half an hour. On emerging, spoke to two women, but went with none. Walked to the opera, and there took another taxi. He returned to his home, 324 Avenue Henri Martin, arriving there at 1.45. You looked him up in the files. Resident of Paris for two years, no occupation. Reputable account at Lloyd's Bank. I have a list of his associates. It will keep. I will speak to 111 now. 111? Edouard Vautrel, said still another voice, left the house in Passy at 20 minutes to one. In his own car, he escorted Madame de Saligny to her home, 144 Avenue du Bois. He left there in five minutes, returned to his car, and drove downtown to Maxime's, Rue Royale. I lost him, monsieur. He apparently left through a door into a neighboring shop. I questioned the proprietor, but he will say nothing. Very sorry. No matter. His antecedents. Came to Paris in 1917 during the Russian Revolution. Enlisted for military service. Army of occupation until 1922. Gives his occupation as that of playwright. Questions to the theaters. The managers of all theaters in Paris are being sent a blank form asking if any plays by a person of that name have been submitted. Good. Now, 46, please. Luigi Fenelli, what of him? To the best of my knowledge, he has not left his establishment tonight. 71 is still at the corner. No phone message yet. Fenelli came to Paris a year ago and sent circulars of his new house to prominent people. Twice arrested in Italy, but never imprisoned. Charges, peddling opium in Naples, aggravated assault and battery. That is all. Head Central. Phone me if any report comes from the laboratory. Instruct them to examine Saligny's fingernails. I want fingerprint samples from all these people. Post a man at the concierge's box in the Fenelli house. Any further instructions? None until tomorrow. Make me an appointment with the juge d'instruction. Slowly. Boncolin replaced the phone.
You see, he remarked, the octopus reaching. It is a gigantic system. I can, at this hour, ascertain the whereabouts of any man in Paris. And you also know how it fails. He slapped the chair arm. His eyes were bright, and he knocked over a glass with a nervous arm when he reached for a cigar. They do not sleep, these men. I have my hands on all of Paris as on a map. A finger moves across streets, up squares, and pauses at a house. A few words into this phone, and the police trap snaps like a deadfall. But the brain of one man opposing us renders all this organization useless. You can fight him only with the brain. He brooded, head in his hands. Then he growled, Drink your coffee. It's getting cold. This was another person from Boncolin, the suave and mocking, the Voltaire of detectives, and the Petronius of the boulevards, the man himself in carpet slippers. I sipped the coffee, but it gave only a whirling sensation to my drowsiness. He sat there in the chair, motionless, with the smoke thickening about him and the ash sliding down his shirt front. As those slow curtains were drawn, it faded, the gaunt face with its pointed beard, staring blindly into the red firelight. Somewhere a clock chimed. The glow of the fire played on the ceiling, made deep shadows round his chair, glimmered on the nickeled telephone. When I roused out of confused dreams, dawn was creeping up the opposite wall. The whole room had turned to gray and shadows, and it was deadly cold, colored like ashes, the whole litter, and shivered with the rattling of the window. The fire was out. Dimly, I could see Boncolin's figure detach itself from the gloom of the tall chair across the hearth. He had not altered his position, though the hearth was strewn with cigar stumps and an empty bottle of brandy hung from his hand. He still sat, chin in his fist, staring into the empty fireplace. Part 8 Wherein the Double Doors Are Opened Others have written of the finale to this case. My own account can have no virtue except that of an eyewitness. There were wild accounts in most of the papers, and what irritated us all most was Le Figaro's smug assertion that it is amazing that the only person to see the truth was Monsieur Boncola, since all the details were before the eyes of the witnesses from the first. Whatever the general public may think of that, it will probably agree with me that the reason why Boncola staged his denouement in the fashion he employed was rather for a psychological vengeance on his adversary than any real desire to extract a confession. You shall judge. Around eight in the morning, I went to my rooms in the square wrap for a bath and a change of clothes. My charitable landlady drew her own conclusions and solicitously inquired after the health of my little girl. Then she found a couple of blood spots when I sent my dinner clothes out to be pressed and became sympathetic to such an extent that I hesitated to tell her they had been caused by a severed head. Madame Hirondelle is prone to hysterics. Unquestionably, I thought when I was drinking chocolate by my own fire, it had been a night. In retrospect, which is the best way to enjoy excitement anyhow, I contemplated it with entire satisfaction. I had had my murder. We will forget the matter until this evening. I am going to have you all as my guests at the central office. Boncolin has said. In the meantime, I suggest you call up some girl and go to an afternoon dance as an antidote against the future. When I did use the telephone to suggest this, it is a hall phone and Madame Hirondelle's door is always open, my astonished landlady inquired after this and that and fell to dietary suggestions of more theoretical than real usefulness. Paris was preening its finery that day. The gigolos were all a cackle on the Champs-Élysées, 
There was a warm, wine-like air made luminous around the green of the Tuileries, whose aisles were in bloom with the early spring crop of artists painting the vista towards the Arc de Triomphe. It was all highlights and watercolor, with the gray face of the Madeleine peering down her street at the obelisk from the Nile. I very nearly forgot the black business of last night in mingling with the whirligig life in the company of my friend Marguerite. She was a demi, which is the word customarily used with tasse, until we entered one of those dancing places where the extra charge is put on the champagne instead of the cover, and the cover is therefore permitted to be dirty. There the inspired orchestra played Hallelujah and followed it up with Bye Bye Blackbird. Then, over in a corner, I saw Mr. Sid Galton. He had just neared that mild state of happiness wherein flipping water in a spoon seems highly humorous, and this he was doing to calculate his range when he should begin in earnest. I saw him look at me, seem puzzled, and then he waved in recognition. His shiny cheeks were freshly shaven and blooming as a baby's. His thin hair was plastered down, and the blue eyes far less bloodshot. A smile dawned. He waddled over, after an appraising glance of the lady beside me. It was the stage for an experiment. I rose and thrust out my hand deliberately. He responded. Now I have normally anything but a strong grip, yet under the pressure when he shook hands, Mr. Galton perceptibly winced. Jeez! Go easy, he protested. Got a saw hand. Fell on it last night. It's no fun. Nor is the sensation pleasant, said I when a bullet hits a flashlight. You're drunk, observed Mr. Galton casually. Wouldn't have thought it, but you are. Well, order him up. Hey, garçon, un martini, see? The afternoon passed somehow. I was a bit preoccupied, and Galton took care of the amusement of my companion, reciting droll stories of his adventures as a ranger in Yellowstone, until somebody had discovered on his property an oil gusher spouting. He illustrated the spouting of the gusher with appropriate pantomime and delivered to him what he described as boku dough. Various parlor tricks served to keep the company at the nearby tables interested in life. We separated at 6.30, and Marguerite, being philosophical, was content to regard one's mood and one's friends as just another of those things. Galton said that he had got a message from Bancolin to be on hand pronto at nine o'clock at the police station. Undoubtedly, there hung over us the shadow of that night. When I returned to my rooms, I found Madame Hirondelle in possession of the afternoon paper. She had even violated an ancient French custom and bought two. All such ladies being embryo tabloid sheets, there is no reason for the tabloid in French life. She brought me in a special tray of tea and croissant in order to dilate on broken romances, which particularly reminded her of the case of her cousin by marriage, who had blue eyes and lived in Bordeaux, and was, figure to yourself, monsieur, only the bride of a knight when, etc. I pondered the etiquette of wearing evening clothes to Boncolin's party, which seemed rather like debating the correctness of a morning coat to attend a guillotining. Then, upstairs, somebody's insufferable gramophone started a scratch through Hallelujah. Everything made a person's thoughts all out of proportion. I gagged at the thought of food, but something was necessary to take one's mind off a killer. A taxi took me to the Grand Boulevards, already flowering with pink lights, and I dropped into a cinema. The player piano rang with a flat, stereotyped sound, like a newspaper editorial. And the peanut shells. Then the picture leaped out at me, and I was struck with the extraordinary resemblance of the star to Boncolin. Except for the latter's beard, the likeness was perfect. Nor could I imagine Boncolin plunged in the amorous intrigue, whose chief purpose seemed to lead the hero as many times as possible into the wrong bedroom. But there was no getting away from that likeness. 
The piece was called La Blonde ou La Brune and featured Mr. Adolphe Manjou. Presently, in one of the feminine leads, who bore the flamboyant name of Miss Arlette Marshall, I began to see a resemblance to Madame Louise de Saligny. This is a state called nerves, and is not at all pleasant. It was 8.30 when I arrived at the vast Palais de Justice. You cannot imagine the size of this palace, which resembles a pictureless Louvre. So I naturally wandered into the department whose purpose I learned was inquiring into the whereabouts of lost dogs. This was laudable but uninteresting. I penetrated three or four corridors before I was found at last by a clever detective and escorted through a maze of rooms to the office of Boncola. It was a small room, panelled in dark wood and lighted by green shaded lamps. Boncolin stood behind the desk in no way like the man I had seen the night before. His suavity was a mask, his voice low and clear, his beard freshly barbered. In a chair beside his desk sat a great lump of a man, like a bald Buddha, with flabby hands folded in his lap. His eyes blinked slowly, automaton fashion, and his jaw was buried in his collar. Monsieur le Comte de Villon, le juge d'instruction, Boncolin introduced. The judge looked me over, craftily, so that I had an uncomfortable idea he would ask for my fingerprints. He grunted and closed his eyes. Boncolin indicated a pair of closed folding doors behind him. The room of my entertainment, he said. That was all except for a faint, glittery smile. I sat down, and for many minutes there was no sound except a deep humming from somewhere in the building. A watch on the table ticked audibly. Monsieur Luigi Fenelli, a voice suddenly announced. I jumped around and saw Fenelli being escorted in. He was very haughty. He fingered his curled mustache, and his hair positively bubbled with oil, so that some of the oil seemed to be spread over his fat face. Tiny eyes darted around. Me, I am here, he proclaimed, and thrust his hand under the breast of his coat. Cloak and hat he offered to the escorting detective. Sit down, please, requested Boncolin. Again, that silence, and the ticking of the watch. Presently Galton came in like a landslide, exuding geniality. But the atmosphere of the room awed him before long. He demanded to know why they didn't have magazines here like any good dentist's office. But his facetiousness trickled away. He sat down and shifted his feet nervously. Francois, the detective who had been on duty in the hall the night before, entered and stood in one corner. Boncolin began to click a pencil against the table, just as he had the night before, when he was questioning Madame Louise de Saligny and Monsieur Edouard Vautrel. The circle was complete. Madame wore a black wrap with a collar of ermine. From this collar she looked out lazily, and her face was like a lovely photograph, slightly out of focus but her black hair was bound back to a knot tonight, which seemed to make the countenance thinner, and her mouth slashed with lipstick. Only the dark, speculative eyes were the same. She greeted Boncolin without the slightest semblance of interest. Vautrel, ostentatiously cool, ran the tip of his finger along the thin line of his mustache. His colorless eyebrows were raised. We are all present. Boncolin said. Monsieur Vautrel, will you be so good as to tell me the time? Your questions seldom vary, do they, monsieur? asked the other. Again, subject to confirmation, it is five minutes past nine. Boncolin contemplated the watch on his desk. Yes, but for the purpose of this meeting, he remarked softly, I prefer that the hour be... Fifteen minutes to eleven. 
Francois, will you be so good as to open those double doors? The distant humming died away. The demonstration had begun. Part 9. The Last Act Boncolin asked us all to enter the room disclosed when the double doors were opened. It was very large, the walls and floor covered with white tile, so that it resembled an operating room in a hospital. Four lamps with green shades hung from the ceiling, immediately above six chairs, ranged in two lines, in such a way that the chairs of the second row were in the open spaces between those of the first, all of them three feet apart. The first row was about fifteen feet from the opposite end of the room. There were no windows. We have often been asked, Boncolin continued, why the prefecture has no psychological laboratory, such as that suggested many years ago by Professor Münsterberg of Harvard. I wish to show you now that we have our own conception of a psychological laboratory. It is eminently a practical one, and so far as I know, there is no duplicate of it in the world. I'm going to ask you to assist me in a parlor game, which has often caused much amusement. I'm going to ask you all, he continued after a silence, to be secured firmly in these chairs and also gagged for all the world as though you had been kidnapped by a cinema-inspired villain. I promise that the fastenings will not chafe you and that you will suffer no annoyance from the gag. I should prefer that everyone exceed in this, including you, he turned to me, Francois and Madame de Saligny, although Madame will be accepted if she prefers. I looked around at the group. Bottrell laughed. It is obvious, he remarked, that children's games are not confined to the nursery. Well, I have no objection, if you don't mean to rob us while we are helpless. I, Louise? I... This is an outrage, bellowed Fanelli. His coat rose on his back like feathers. To such proceedings! You are, of course, at liberty to refuse, said Boncolin carelessly. Fanelli worked his mouth a moment and added, but if the others agree. Bowing, Boncolin turned to Galton and rapidly translated his words into English. Sure, it's all right with me, but no funny business, mind, Galton amended. He stared at the detective and whispered to me, Wise guy, that one. Madame de Saligny showed no more agreement or disagreement than before. She simply shrugged. I do not care. Manacles, felt lined, were on the arms and legs of the chairs. Boncola left us all to the selection of our chairs, standing before the group like a professor before his class. There was hesitation. We all glanced at each other, and it was Madame who first sat down in the end chair of the first row to our left. Vautrell took the one beside her, then Fanelli. Galton took the end chair to the right in the second row, then Francois, finally myself. Two attendants appeared out of a door I had not previously seen and went about fastening the manacles on our wrists and legs with snap locks. They produced half a dozen gags, like mustache smoothers, with cotton for the covering of the mouth. Before these are fastened, said Boncolin, I should like to ask one question. Monsieur Fenelli, how should you describe the late Saligny? I could see Fenelli's profile, partly turned in astonishment. Why, uh, why, uh, monsieur, he was a uh, tall and uh, good looking and blonde. He was, uh, the manager hesitated and chewed at his mustache. I don't know that I can make it clearer. He was. Can you make it any clearer? Describe Saligny? Galton was asked next. Why, sure, big fella, always wore mighty fine clothes. Monsieur Vautrel. Precisely six feet tall, responded Vautrel amusedly. Weight seventy kilos, eyes round, nose convex, 
teeth, perfect, mole on the right eyebrow. Is this detailed enough for you? You may apply the gags, monsieur. The gags did not make one uncomfortable, but the helpless feeling these and the manacles engendered caused uneasiness. It was final. No matter what happened, you stayed. A murderer could... Suddenly the lights went out, all except a drop lamp over Boncolin's head, where he stood immediately at our left, causing us all to turn our eyes. He stood, weird and inscrutable in that spot of light, which showed the hollows in his face. The face became satanic. He smiled, and for some reason I felt a shiver of nervousness. Darkness, tied and gagged in one's chair. There was not a sound in that vast building until Boncolin spoke. The last light, please. We were in total darkness now. My heart was beating heavily. Fully ten minutes passed. The first thing which enters one's mind, Boncolin continued, in a low monotone which drifted from another corner as though he were no longer there, is the idea of a church. Was somebody talking? A mass of people? I heard a deep but very faint humming of voices, broken with tinny laughter. The sounds of people shuffling. An auto horn honked, two of them. Distinctly, I could smell the scent of banked flowers, hear a rustling. The blackness whirled before one's eyes, resolved into shapes and twistings. Those tiny voices made a laughing, rising blur. Suddenly, there crashed through the room the sweep of an organ, swelling, the wedding march from Lohengrin. The organ died away. There was a faint, rasping sob. The darkness assumed gigantic and horrible shapes, wove and broke like foam on water. After a silence, Boncolin's voice drifted dully. Certain people have discovered that this man who stands as bridegroom at the altar is not the true Saligny. No, the true Saligny. That sound far away in the dark, the bumping of a trunk being hauled upstairs. Thump, thump, the wheeze of panting breath. It was six months ago in another city that something came to that trunk. At first it seemed an illusion, and yet the darkness changed color, shifted with a weird green light as against gauze. The sound of lapping water, violins in the waltz of the blue Danube, a shadow shot across this light before our eyes, the monstrous shadow of a man upreared in profile. Something sprang at it, and there lashed down a knife. A thud from sudden darkness again, and a faint groan. Then I no longer heard lapping water, but a slow drip, as of thick fluid. The violins pulsed, were joined by other instruments. The people have discovered all this before the marriage. But the marriage takes place. Night comes to Paris. Now that distant, muted music blew faster, a hysterical note that swung to Hallelujah. The song beat against one's ears in tinny resonance. Over it drifted a hum of conversation, the high laughter, the shrill chant of a croupier, the clicking dance of the ball in the wheel. The air was overpoweringly hot and dense with a smell of powder, and the orchestra beat shook against it like a madman on a cage. It is not loud, said Boncolin's far voice, because you are in the card room. The clock. Yes. The clock was striking. It tinkled with eerie chimes. Then it sounded clear notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, with maddening deliberation. Already, Boncolin's voice was becoming more swift. The assassin 
is preparing. The sword has been taken down from the wall and hidden beneath a row of pillows on the divan for use later. Look, the assassin is closing the door. It had been so vivid that I had a mental picture of the card room before me. Then it was that I realized it was no mental picture at all. Staring into the dark, eyes growing used to it, I could see the inside of the card room. I looked at it from the side on which the window would be. There were the leprous red walls. There was the door to the salon at my right. In the wall directly ahead, the door to the hall. There at the left was the divan, dull old rose with its pillows, and the red shaded lamp on the table, throwing a subdued light over it. But I saw that scene as through a faint mist, hazy and unreal, a stage for ghosts, and yet with those sounds, and that human laughter pulsing around. Yes, and the door into the hall was being softly closed, so softly that it hardly swayed the bell rope beside it. The knob turned, the latch clicked, and was still. Just a few minutes after eleven, the murderer had planted his sword and left the room. Faint music, in a long interval. The knob was turning again. I could feel that the gag against my mouth was dryly rubbing my teeth. The scene whirled. The dead man walked into the room. Saligny, or rather, Laurent, posing as Saligny. Vital, alive, carrying on his shoulders that head I had seen grinning from the floor. Behind him came the woman who was his wife, Louise, languorous, feverish-eyed. Not a word was spoken. The two moved like phantoms. They stopped in the middle of the room, and the horrible marionettes kissed. Kissed. He seemed to be speaking inaudible words, and she was replying. She lighted a cigarette, inhaled deeply a few moments, and laughed soundlessly. You could see him smirking sideways at you now. She ground out the cigarette against an ashtray. Her eyes moved towards the place where the window should be, and I stared into them. Then she pointed to the button of her slipper, which had become unfastened. She advanced almost to the divan and put out her left foot. While he knelt over the slipper, she threw her weight to the right as though leaning against the divan. Cat-like, she leapt aside. In her hands, the great sword flashed aloft and fell. His head seemed to leap like a grisly toy, springing out on wires. The scene went dark. Somewhere, the orchestra banged into the last bar of Hallelujah. It is not yet 11.15, Boncolin's voice snapped. See, she looks around. She shakes the head aloft in triumph. She picks up the head and gestures like Salome. This man who would have killed her, she has killed. Then she becomes tense, ready, watchful. She has left a cigarette that must be destroyed. She drops it into her wrist bag. There are some ashes on the rug. She grinds them into the nap with her heel. Then she leaves again by the hall door, having raised the window to let the smoke out. And why has she done this? Why has she not denounced this man, whom she knows to be an impostor, to the police? So that the world will never know he is not the real Saligny. So that she, having married him, will inherit his fortune, which she can enjoy with her confederate, Votrel. Now the murder committed, Vautrel, who planned all this, must supply her with an alibi. She knows that the detective Boncolin is sitting in the main salon, down at its far end. Very soon she joins him. To all outward appearances, Saligny, or Laurent, is not yet dead. She talks of him. At precisely 11.30, according to a prearranged signal, a man walks through the door of the cardroom from the salon. 
his back is turned, and he is thirty feet away from the people she has joined. But he is tall and blonde. She says, There goes Raoul now. But that man was Vautrel. As one puzzles at a cryptogram and slowly sees the letters click into place one by one, fewer gaps and fewer. Vautrel simply walked through the card room, pulling the bell cord deliberately as he went, walked out into the hall. But he turned to his left and entered the smoking room by the door in the projection of the wall which conceals the card room door from the eyes of the detective seated at the end of the hall. Vautrel walks out the door of the smoking room into the hall and speaks to the detective. The whole process, by time tests, consumes just twelve and one-half seconds. His own alibi was now complete, as well as that of his colleague. He has summoned the boy with the cocktails by pulling the bell, so that the body may be discovered and he can possess this alibi. Ladies and gentlemen, Boncolin cried out of the dark, there will be no more pictures, no more stage effects. You see now that these two were working together to gain control of Saligny's fortune. Mr. Galton blurted out the truth about their affair. That was why it was necessary to go through with the marriage. But the body of the real Saligny must be disposed of. This body was then in a trunk at the home of Saligny, and Vautrel must have known of it. He left the gambling house, took Madame home, and then, knowing that he was followed, he eluded my shadower at Maxime's and drove to the back door of Saligny's house, arriving there around 1.30. He carried the body downstairs, having wrapped it in a blanket. Then he walled it up in the cellar. By that time, my companion and I had arrived. He did not know of our presence and tried to come upstairs, probably to get rid of the blood-stained sawdust or dispose of the trunk by carrying it away. The intervention of Girard led him to murder. He escaped by the cellar door, having stolen a bunch of keys on a previous visit to Saligny. Just when he learned that Saligny was the madman, Laurent, we shall have to ask him to tell us himself. The single drop light appeared over Boncolin's head, but the rest of us were in shadow. I leaned back limply, and I was exhausted. And now, said Boncolin, before turning on the lights over you, I may tell you the purpose of this experiment. I venture to predict that Monsieur Vautrel's chair is empty. If you will examine your manacles, you will see that with a little easy manipulation, you could have slipped them off without difficulty. None of you has tried to slip them off, I venture to assert. This was because you were innocent. The crux of our practical psychology and the reason why this test was tried is that the guilty person always does. The room appeared in a flood of light. There was a nervous, exhausted calm and a strained silence. The sweated hair clung to Galton's forehead, and I could hear him wheezing behind his gag. Benelli seemed about to melt. Madame lay back in her chair, head lolling, one wrist free. Bautrel's chair was empty. Boncola walked to the middle of the room, but he did not speak. The tile walls lent that room the chill semblance of a morgue. Laboriously, Madame worked herself free. She rose, swayed a little, tried to untie the gag, and finally ripped it off. Her ermine collar lay back from her throat, and she was panting. The face was sunken, a Madonna out of which peeped a vulture, and the dry lipstick cracked on her mouth. Her eyes, as she turned her head from side to side, were empty and frightening, a ruin. Hard, harsh light. Then the sound of steps on the tile floor. Two gendarmes appeared, escorting Vautrel between them. He carried his coat over his arm, and he had casually lighted a cigarette. Your weakness, Louise de Saligny said, with sudden shrillness. 
You left, did you? Damn you! She leaned crookedly against the chair. The beauty and languor peeled away from her. Well, tell them. Go on. Frightened at a lot of stage traps. Tell them. Luttrell was breaking. He tried to keep his mouth straight, but his forehead was a glitter of sweat. He tried to be contemptuous, but the ivory cigarette holder trembled. You fixed up that story about ordering the cocktails, Madame said, giggling. I knew it. Wouldn't go. You wanted me to kill him. You hadn't the nerve. In a public place where we could prove an alibi. If you'd listened to me, she smirked. Yes, I'll tell them. Do you think I care about my precious neck? Or do you want to kiss my neck now, as you used to? Ah, that divine neck. You goat of a Russian. Well, go on. It will be your last chance before the guillotine hits it. She drew her hand across her throat, and her laugh echoed against the walls. Botrell's face was ghastly. The coat slid from his arm, and the cigarette spilled fire down his chin. With a terrific gritting of his nerves, he drew himself up. In a clear, defiant voice, he sneered at Boncolin. Why, yes, I left your performance. I thought I would go up and see the Grand Guignol. If your men hadn't interfered, I should have been just in time for the second act. He essayed a bow towards the detective. Then he lurched and slid down in a dead faint. High and shrill against the tiles rang the laughter of Louise de Saligny. Part 10 Boncolin takes a curtain call. You will want some explanations, I take it, said Boncolin. Well, there were certain features of the case which were clear from the moment I entered the room of the murder, and others which baffled me for the extraordinary time of nearly twelve hours. Again, we were sitting in his littered study, before a fire which looked a great deal more cheerful than that of the night before. He had mellowed under the influence of an appalling quantity of Verve Clicquot, and I was far from taciturn myself. He lighted a cigar luxuriously and leaned back to blow thoughtful rings at the firelight. Let us take it from the beginning. Before Madame Louise was supposed to know about the murder, when we were all sitting there in the salon, you remember that I salvaged her cigarette, as I told you. Possibly the implication of much hashish has not occurred to you. It is the killer's drug. If you doubt it, look up the origin of the word assassin, which is a direct derivation. A confirmed user is at any time liable to go amok. We get that phrase from the drug, too. It makes them nearly as insane as our first troublemaker, Laurent. Then we were called into the room of the murder. You probably noted that heavy, sweet odor. If you ever dabble with this case in fiction, be sure to include it. It suggested hashish. She smoked before us in the other room, but the overpowering collection of other smells made it confused with powder and perfume. Now that room was perfectly clear, and it appeared quite distinctly. The window was up, which might or might not have been an indication that it was raised to drive out the odor. At any rate, it created a strong suspicion that Madame had been there a short time before. A short time, or the odor would have been entirely dissipated. Next, we examine the position of the body. It was in a grotesque kneeling position, showed no sign of a struggle, and indicated that he had been hit from behind, as I pointed out. The body of a decapitated man, as we discover at the guillotine, has a habit of freezing into its position. Now, imagine to yourself the only way in the world it would have been possible to get him into that position, so that he could be struck from behind. Why, attending to the fastening of a lady's slipper. It is not normally necessary to demand masculine attention to the stocking or the garter. 
well, or the roll, if you insist. My comment about pillows, which seems to have puzzled you, was perfectly simple. It might surprise the victim to see a sharp sword lying in full view on the divan, and pillows in a line would very effectually conceal it. Thus far, it was a woman's crime, and I thought I could name the woman. Strength? Remember that once before, Madame Louise had overpowered a madman, as I told you. And so it was no very far stretch of the imagination to conceive of her wielding that sword. Was it possible, I thought, that the time of the crime might have been before half past eleven? I would pigeonhole the idea with the question, who was the man who actually entered, and why? Before I came there, I already had a suspicion that the man posing as Saligny was Laurent. When we found the pictures of himself in his pockets, it suggested not so much conceit as an endless studying of his prototype, especially since some of the pictures were not at all flattering. Find me the beau who preserves pictures that make him look hideous. Then, that question of a weapon in his pockets. It was curious. But we found no weapon in his pocket, I protested. Ah, that was the curious thing. Put yourself in the place of a man who fears for his life from an unknown assailant. Would you go around entirely unarmed, particularly if you were one of the finest pistol shots in Europe? Now, I thought to myself, is it possible that Madame Louise knew this too? Might she have killed him because of it? If so, why in the devil's name does she not speak and exonerate herself. Hold that idea in mind, please. Remember that Laurent is a cunning villain who sends notes to himself, and when he knows he is being shadowed at the opium house, voluntarily tells the police, so that we shall believe he has merely been collecting evidence. Then came the crux, that outlandish business of the bell being rung. The question is, who rang it? The false Saligny or the murderer? If Saligny rang it, the murderer certainly was insane. For after his victim has rung a bell which will summon a witness quite soon, he coolly kills Saligny anyhow. If the murderer rang it, the same rule applies. He blithely rang for a witness to see him commit the murder, since he could not have known that the boy would be delayed in answering the bell. The only tenable hypothesis, however, is that the man whom we saw enter the room rang the bell. If it was not Saligny, who was it? And here is the locked room. Where did that man go? I now switch back to the idea that when the bell was rung, the victim had already been killed, and the evidence points to Louise de Saligny. Who could have been the man who entered the room? By his size and the color of his hair, only Vautrel. Well then, Vautrel knew about the crime, and Madame knew it was he who entered, if she had just left her husband without a head. It was pretty evidence of collusion, when coupled with Galton's drunken assertion about a possible affair there. Collusion? Why? The answer is obvious. They know about the false Saligny, but they must keep the world thinking it was Saligny, or there would be no fortune. But how could they have known this? The probability was that the false Saligny's refusal to indulge in sports had aroused Vautrel's suspicions, and he investigated Saligny's house, indicated by the fact that he stole the cellar keys. When he learned about the trunk, we shall not know until the juge d'instruction gets his confession. But clearly, he had to hurry to Saligny's house and destroy that damning evidence that an impostor was about. The house would have been gone over by the attorneys and the appraisers of the estate, and a conspicuous trunk in the study would assuredly have been opened. Having already provided an alibi for Madame and for himself, Vautrel would return to Saligny's home as soon as he could. 
I did not, naturally, know about the trunk until we ourselves reached the premises. But it seemed probable that there was in that house some evidence of a false Saligny, which Vautrel would wish destroyed. I shall be very much surprised if the executors do not unearth a diary, some letters in Laurent's handwriting, or other suspicious material. That Vautrel had visited Saligny's home on the day before the murder is fairly clear, since he knew about and suspected the trunk. This was probably when he stole the keys of the cellar door. So, after the killing of Laurent, he gave my shadower the slip, recall the operative's report over the telephone, and went back to hide the body of the real Saligny. Fresh mortar does not ordinarily lie about loose in cellars, and presents another indication that not only was the prowler familiar with the house, but that he had prepared for his work on that or the preceding day. The intruder was, then, a close friend of Saligny. But why didn't Galton fit in as well? He lived next door, too. Zutelo, that Galton hypothesis of yours is an idée fixe. I narrated the experiment of the handshake in the café and added, that was why I suspected him to the very last minute. Boncolin chuckled. <laughs> well, some of our evidence hinges round the flashlight. Let us take that into consideration. Galton's bad hand was no evidence at all that he was guilty. Have you ever had anything knocked out of your hand by a pistol bullet? I confess to no such charming experience. A light object would cause no more disastrous result than a momentary jar. Something very heavy, of course, might numb one's hand, but certainly not an electric torch. Did you think for a moment that I was trying to hit the intruder with my shots? Well, since you fired point-blank at him, it seemed highly probable. Why? I knew who the intruder was, and I also was morally certain he carried no pistol. Why should he? He expected to find the house deserted. But remember, above all, that we ourselves were fully as guilty of housebreaking as he. I hardly wanted to complicate matters by unnecessary shooting. Had I known that Girard was in danger, I would have dropped him. But I cannot lay claim to omniscience. What I was doing, sound as it may like the master detective of fiction, was estimating his height. How? Well, if you are holding an electric torch, what is the natural position of your hand? Try it. You see? Waist high. Now, I took good aim. I couldn't have had a better target. And put two bullets through the flashlight firing from the stairs. One of the bullets nicked the newel post at the precise height of the electric torch and then entered the floor. Calculating from my own position on the stairs and estimating the mark on the newel post as indicating the man's waist, it was not too difficult to estimate his height at about six feet. It is without doubt a unique, if somewhat too spectacular, method of taking a man's measurements. But it seems to this hard-headed person that it would have been much simpler neatly to put those bullets through both legs. My dear fellow, you are saturated with traditions of American gunplay. In France, the police shoot only as a last resort. Besides, a sense of drama prevented me from pouncing too soon on my victim, and thereby cost a man's life. But proceed. So, the height of the murderer, went on Boncolin expansively, excludes definitely your candidate, Monsieur Galton. Your last remarks indicate why I did not give you a loaded pistol. Had you been in my place, you would have felt an overwhelming urge to clutter up the premises with bullets on the slightest provocation. You would have caught the machine-gun urge of New York and Chicago, in which cities, I am told, under the beneficent American government, a man has no personal liberties except the full and free right to commit murder. Thereby, I said, causing French detectives to talk like United States senators. It is true, he protested. That is the philosophy of your great country. 
It is even so bad that every time I see in the newsreels a picture of your president, Monsieur Coolidge, he is either wearing a cowboy suit or indulging in rifle practice. Diable! The crime situation must be terrible. It is certainly a branch of crime, I said, sponsored by the Women's Christian Temperance Union and kindred producers of nausea. You were saying? About the murder. When you add the evidence of the cigarette ashes in the card room containing hashish, the fingerprints on the window being those of Madame, you add a couple of details which never interested me, but which would be highly valuable in a court of law. A search of Vautrel's house tonight produced the gloves he had worn to bury Saligny and kill Girard. What is the evidence in a pair of soiled gloves? I have a pair myself. I would warn you never to discount the efforts of our tireless laboratory. Did you know that the fibers of certain fabrics impressed on a receptive surface will print their individual weave, exactly like fingerprints? And that no two weaves, even on a machine-made article, are precisely similar under a microscope? No, Jack. It is no longer safe even to use gloves. The fiber prints on the dust of the knife that stabbed Girard correspond with the soiled gloves Vautrel had neglected to throw away. Is there any more of this scientific evidence? All the evidence which will convict those two is scientific. You recall my request to examine the false Saligny's fingernails. Clinging to the inside of the nail on the first finger of his right hand was a bit of silk about a sixteenth of an inch long, scratched from Madame's stocking when he fell. Of course, I could not see it. I did not know it was there, but I trusted to the laboratory to discover anything that might be there. The octopus has eyes, too. You neglect nothing, do you? Then all that mummery of reproducing the crime was unnecessary. Oh, well, I... I had to have a little personal satisfaction, he explained, somewhat apologetically. I am inherently a mountebank. It is our national weakness, as constant gunplay is yours. When I can be aided by dummy tile walls, pleasing musical effects, shadow graphs, and certain actors expertly made up, one with a wax head, which will fall at the application of a tin sword, I cannot resist the temptation to become a disciple of Hollywood. Besides, I am fond of sticking pins in my fellow mortals to see how they will react. I studied Vautrel, and I fancied he would break before Madame. It was a test. He sat a long while silent in the firelight, so motionless that the ash did not fall from his cigar. Examine closely, my friend, he said at last, the extremely contained person who never cuts loose, who never indulges in a good, healthy, plebeian brawl, who affects indifference and boredom. That man is the extreme in self-consciousness. He is never sure of himself, and at the climax he will crack. Madame, on the other hand, was the opposite. You recall how she was willing to speak so freely and personally before you, a stranger. I rather imagined she would outlast him, and I was curious about both Galton and Fenelli. He chuckled. Again, I guessed correctly. The American had nothing on his mind. It scared him to a shadow, and thus he enjoyed it thoroughly. And at least... It will furnish a better subject for conversation than Yellowstone Park. As for Fenelli, it was almost necessary to escort him home in an ambulance. And now, he concluded, reaching over to take the champagne bottle from its cooler, we have finished. I give you a wish, the conclusion of all cases. The broad glasses clinked together in the firelight. Then, at Boncolin's elbow, the telephone rang. The pieces of his overturned glass lay shattered on the hearth, 
and as he picked up the phone eagerly, the spilled champagne crawled and sizzled about the burning logs. John Dixon Carr John Dixon Carr was born in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, on the 30th of November, 1906. As a child, he attended Uniontown High School, where he took part in several theater productions. Fired up by his father's extensive library and inspired by ghost stories he had been told as a boy, Carr's first short story was published in the school magazine. More stories appeared, and despite being written by a teenager, all are immensely enjoyable. After school and in the holidays, he hung around the office of the Uniontown Daily Herald, which his father had at one time edited. He managed to secure ad hoc employment, reviewing sporting events and theatre, as well as what would now be styled an op-ed, in which he expressed sometimes controversial opinions on anything from politics to spiritualism, even the Darwinian theory of evolution. Journalism and the pressure to meet deadlines gave Carr invaluable experience, but his real love was storytelling. From Uniontown High School, he went to The Hill, where he wrote detective stories and ghost stories, an adventure serial, and essays on political themes, like the value of supranational leadership through the League of Nations. On leaving The Hill, Carr went up to Haverford College in Pennsylvania, where, unsurprisingly, he quickly began writing for the college magazine. Mysteries, historical romances, ghost stories, poetry, and humorous stories, including one that advocated raising babies on a diet of beer. He was soon appointed editor of the Haverfordian and sat on the board of Snooze, the college humor magazine. In the autumn of 1926, Carr created the character of Henri Boncolin, a French investigator who owes something to Aristide Valentin, the anti-companion of G.K. Chesterton's Father Brown, who would appear in several novels and short stories. In the early 1930s, Carr created his best-known character, Dr. Gideon Fell, whose intellect and physique were inspired by Chesterton himself. Over the next 35 years, Fell would appear in short stories, radio plays, and 23 novels, confronting Carr's hallmark mystery, The Impossible Crime. Murder behind locked doors, in the middle of a snowy street, or in plain view of spectators, when no murderer can be seen. Death in the centre of an unmarked tennis court, on top of an inaccessible tower, or during a seance, when everyone in the room is holding hands. Carr's ingenuity was boundless. Carr also started writing under other names. As Carter Dixon, the best known of his pseudonyms, he created the ebullient and eccentric British peer, Sir Henry Merivale, known to one and all as H.M., who is based on Carr's father, but also has something in common with Sherlock Holmes's brother, the intelligent, if indolent, Mycroft Holmes. The Merivale mysteries are also concerned with impossible crimes, although the problems are, if anything, even more incredible than those encountered by Dr. Fell. In one book, someone disappears after diving into a swimming pool. In another, a man is apparently ejected from a roof by invisible hands. Victims are shot or stabbed within locked rooms or found clubbed to death within a building that is surrounded by unbroken snow. H.M. appears in 20 novels and a few Merivale short stories. As well as several standalone novels, Carr collaborated on one mystery with his friend John Street, who wrote as John Road, whom Carr used as the basis for another detective, Colonel March, of the Department of Queer Complaints, 1940. Carr was passionate about history, which led to the murder of Sir Edmund Godfrey, 1936, in which he investigated a crime that had taken place almost 300 years earlier, the mysterious stabbing of a magistrate close to Carr's London home. In 1939, Carr joined the British Broadcasting Corporation, primarily to write morale-boosting propaganda plays for the radio, like Britain Shall Not Burn and Gunsight Girl, 
to highlight bad behaviour at home in docudramas such as Black Market, or to expose Nazi atrocities in thrilling dramas like Starvation in Greece. Of course, he also wrote mysteries, including one with an extraordinary, least likely suspect solution that Agatha Christie herself would have envied. Carl loved writing for radio, and he has a good claim to be the most important author of Golden Age radio mysteries. He is certainly the only person to do so on both sides of the Atlantic, with plays in two major long-running series, Suspense in the U.S., and Appointment with Fear in the UK. Carr also created the series Cabin B-13, scripts from which are to be published by Crippen and Landrew. While working for the BBC, as well as writing original plays and adapting his own short stories, Carr adapted the work of some of the writers who had most influenced him, including that of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, whose biography he wrote in later years along with a series of pastiche adventures, The Exploits of Sherlock Holmes, 1954, co-authored with Conan Doyle's son, Adrian. After the Second World War, Carr turned to historical mysteries as a means of escaping post-war austerity, including the excellent The Devil in Velvet, 1951, and Fire, Burn, 1957. In 1958, Carr and his wife left Britain for America, where they set up home near Fred Danay, half of the Ellery Queen partnership, and the magician Clayton Rawson. Both were luminaries of the Mystery Writers of America, of which Carr had been made president in 1949, and was the only person to hold that position as well as secretary of the Detection Club in Britain. Carr continued to write, and he also undertook a lecture tour, but his health was beginning to decline and in the spring of 1963 he suffered a stroke which paralysed his left side. Even after this, he did not stop writing, now using only one hand, although his later novels do not compare well to the superbly plotted mysteries he produced in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. For several years, Carr also reviewed books for Harper's and Ellery Queen's Mystery magazine. He died of lung cancer on the 27th of February, 1977. Grand Guignol, the only uncollected novella to feature Henri Boncolin, was first published in the Haverfordian in March and April, 1929. It was expanded by Carr into his first novel, It Walks by Night, 1930. The Orange Plot Mysteries in the mid-1930s, many national newspapers in Britain published short stories and serials, with mysteries proving to be particularly fruitful. One of the most popular weeklies was the Sunday Dispatch, which in 1938 commissioned two series of stories from the Crime Club, a publishing imprint created by the publishers William Collins. In his definitive and lavishly illustrated history of Collins' Crime Club, the Hooded Gunman, 2019. John Curran recounts how it evolved out of the publisher's earlier initiative, the Detective Story Club, to become the best-known and longest-lived brand in crime and mystery fiction. Between 1930 and 1994, a total of 2,012 Crime Club books were published, including titles by Agatha Christie, Nio Marsh, and many of the biggest names of the genre. The first tranche of stories commissioned by the Sunday Dispatch, all six of which are included here, appeared weekly between the 6th of March and the 10th of April, 1938. Each of the six writers, including the series compere Peter Cheney, who also wrote the first story, and William Collins himself, who wrote the last, was challenged to write a short story around the following plot. One night, a man picked up an orange in the street. This saved his life. The Orange Kid by Peter Cheney Snavelsky, third assistant in the district attorney's office, who trebled his official salary by fixing for Pirelli, the local big shot, walked out of the elevator and along the passage. He had his coat collar turned up, 
but he couldn't disguise his bow legs, his thin shoulders, his peculiar walk. Lounging outside Pirelli's main door, Scanchi and Fanagan, the mobster's two gorillas, quickly recognized him. Scanchi grinned. Hey, hey, look it, he mouthed. Here comes the law. Ah, you snev, have you come for a cut, or are you pinching somebody today? Fanagan raspberried. Both gorillas laughed. The third assistant DA shot them a venomous look. Pushed past, went through the first door along the passage, through the second, into Moxie Pirelli's room. Pirelli pushed the girl he was kissing back into her chair. He straightened up. His wide mouth eased into a grin when he saw Snovelsky. Hey, where's the fire? He said cheerfully. What's eating you, Snev? Have they got wise you around in the DA's office and handed you a kick in the pants? Or have you come around here to say that you're thinking of raising the ante? If so, come again. There's nothing doing. Not a thing. Snovelsky turned down his coat collar. There were beads of sweat across his forehead. Send that mall out of here, he said. This is business. Pirelli nodded at the girl. She got up and went out. She pulled a face at Snovelsky as she went. She was 23, plump in the right places, with good legs and an impudent expression. She was expensively and somewhat flashily dressed, with a skirt that was too tight round the hips. Snovelsky found himself thinking that he liked malls in tight skirts. So what? said Pirelli. He did not offer a drink. He didn't like the third assistant. He despised him. It's bad, Moxie, said Snovelsky. Here's the setup. We can't cover up any longer for you on that downtown warehouse shooting. The feds are on the job. They got some tie-up that the shooting was connected with a treasury bond grab. They're making it a federal job, see? Okay? The DA had me in today and gave me a nasty one off the ice. He says we gotta pull somebody in for that killing. He don't care who, but it's gotta be somebody and it's gotta be quick. If we don't, that lousy G crowd will be around here, putting the heat on the town generally, and we'll all be sugared. Got that? Pirelli sat down. He ran a finger between a fat neck and a silk collar. He thought. I got it, he said at last. He began to grin. He leaned forward as far as his gross stomach would let him. Then, get this, Snovelsky, he said, and get it right. I'm going to throw a party tomorrow out at the Grapevine Inn, okay? The place will be full up and they'll all be my boys, see? There won't be strangers around. Right. At 11.45, you concentrate a police cruiser out there. They can hide in among the trees on the other side of the highway, okay? They just stick around, see? They wait there. At 10 minutes to 12, I'm going to send a certain guy out of the inn by the front doorway. This guy will have an orange in his hand. You got that? That's good enough for you. Directly the cruiser squad. See this guy come out with the orange in his hand? They let him have it plenty. They don't arrest him. They just let him have it good in the guts. And they're going to be justified, see? The reason they shoot right away like that is because he's got an orange in his hand. See? Snovelsky looked across at Pirelli with wide eyes. You mean, he said, you mean... I mean, the guy with the orange will be the orange kid, said the mobster. Ain't that good enough? He grinned. Everybody knows that when that bozo chucks a bomb, it's always inside an orange skin. So all the cops have got to say is that he was just about to chuck one of his usual egg bombs inside the usual orange skin, and they had to shoot first. I got it says Snovelsky. But why the kid? Why? Don't get curious, said Pirelli. You keep your nose clean and shut your trap. I got reasons. He grinned. That was the orange kid's doll in here just now, he went on. See? I see, said Snovelsky. Okay, I got it. We give it to the kid for resisting arrest and attempting to throw a bomb and we discover afterwards that he was the guy who pulled the warehouse killing. Correct, said Pirelli. Now scram, because you make me feel sick in the stomach.
It was 11.30. The party at the grapevine was tops. Everybody who was anybody was there, most of them very high. When Pirelli threw a party, he threw one. Irma, who was dancing with a kid downstairs, stopped when she saw Scanchi giving her the eye sign. She told the kid she'd broken a suspender, that she'd be back in a minute. Upstairs in the bedroom corridor, Pirelli was waiting for her. He gave her a big hug. Now listen, kiddo, he said. Here it is. In five minutes, I'm going to send for the kid. I'm going to send him out to pick up a guy on the other side of the highway. Just as he's going out of my bedroom here, you come along the passage and ask him to bring you back an orange with him. I've fixed that the only place where there's an orange is on the stand just inside the front entrance. And there'll only be one orange there, see? So the kid will grab it off the fruit girl pronto because it's the only one. And he'll take it out of the front entrance with him so as nobody else gets it because he loves you so much. He grinned. After which, we'll buy him a nice wreath of roses with he was our dear pal in silver wording on it. And you can move over to me. Got that? I got it, she said. She put up her lips. Gee, have you got brains, Moxie? She gurgled. Fanagan found the orange kid in the bar. Hey, kid, he said. The big boy wants you. He's up in his room. It's business. The kid nodded, finished his rye, turned round and made for the stairs. He was five feet ten, slim, an elegant dresser. He'd got style. He moved like a professional dancer and he could twist a four-inch nail between his fingers. He had big blue eyes and an innocent expression. Women went for him. The kid had played along with Pirelli for five years. He knew where he was with Pirelli. To him, the mobster was the big boy, the real thing. To an east side wop kid, brought up to pinching off barrows from the age of four, snatching bags in the street, and acting as lookout for the boys from the age of ten, and every sort of mayhem from the age of fifteen. Pirelli looked like the real business. Pirelli had made him what he was, and he was the finest shopfront blaster in the business. From the time the bombs were made, down in McGarrow's warehouse basement, to the time when the kid threw them concealed in the usual orange skin, with unerring aim into the shops, offices, even bathrooms, of such folk as were foolish enough not to consent to pay for protection. The orange kid saw the business through, coolly and smilingly. And even if the blasting business was not so profitable since repeal, he was also a very good and useful guy with a gun. Life was okay. The orange kid thought he was big time in the mob, thought that Irma was the cutest doll ever. Everything was okey doke So, what the hell? He pushed open the door of the bedroom and sauntered in. Pirelli was sitting at a desk in the corner. Scanchy grinned at the kid and handed him a highball. Sit down, kid said Pirelli. Here's the way it is. Windy Pereira's coming down tonight from Wisconsin. He's due to show up here right now, okay? Well, I don't want him to come in here. I just come to the conclusion that it wouldn't be so good. There's too many wise guys around here tonight who might put the wrong sort of construction on me having a meeting with Pereira, see? Scram downstairs, kid, and go over the other side of the highway. Flag Pereira when you see that light blue sedan of his and tell him to lay off coming in here. Tell him to ease right along to the Honeysuckle Inn and that I'll come along there and talk business to him at 12 o'clock. You got that? Okay, said the kid. He swallowed the drink and went out of the room whistling. Outside, down the passage, he met Irma coming out of a bedroom. You want to dance, kid? She said. He smiled at her. No. I'm doing a little job. I'll be seeing you. I'm staying right up here till you come back, kid, she said. I don't want them monkeys downstairs manhandling me on the dance floor. I'll wait. He lit a cigarette. Sweet baby, he said. He gave her a hug. And bring me back an orange, kid, when you come, she said. There's some at the entrance. 
You better grab one as you go out, because they all got dry mouths downstairs, and they'll be fighting for him later on. Okay, honey, said the kid. He walked towards the stairs. The orange basket in the front hall was empty. I'm sorry, said the fruit girl. Some drunk grabbed the last one before I could stop him. I told the sap that Mr. Pirelli said it wasn't to be touched, but he wouldn't listen. Where'd he go? asked the kid. He went out of the side entrance, said the girl. He was high, all right. The kid walked back along the passage and out by the side entrance. Away across the lawn, leading to the side road, he could see the drunk lurching along precariously. The kid went after him. Out on the side road, he stopped with a grin. The drunk had evidently dropped the orange. It was lying in the gutter. The kid picked it up and polished it with his handkerchief. As he stood in the shadow of the hedgerow that surrounded the grapevine, he stiffened suddenly. Two cars slid along the side road, pulled up on the waste ground in the shadow of the trees. The kid watched them, saw four men get out of each, two with Tommy guns, two with sawn-off shotguns. Moonlight flashed on a Sam Brown belt buckle. The law. The kid stood there thinking. There flashed back into his mind the remark of the fruit girl. I told the sap that Mr. Pirelli said it wasn't to be touched. Why should Pirelli want that orange left there? And why did Irma suddenly want an orange? And why was he sent out to meet Windy Pereira and his exit timed with the arrival of a couple of police gun squads? The kid got it. So he was to be the sucker. He walked quickly back across the lawn, around to the back of the grapevine into the garage. He found his roadster, started it up, backed it out on the gravel path at the back of the inn rear wall. He got out and left the engine running. He opened the toolbox in the rear carrier and took out what he wanted. He put it inside the breast of his jacket. Then he eased quietly around to the side entrance, went in and up the stairs. Irma was waiting in the corridor. She looked a trifle surprised when he appeared. Hello, kid, he said. Come along here. I got something funny to tell you. They walked along to Pirelli's room. The kid kicked the door open, pushed the girl in, and stepped in after her. He had a flat, snub-nosed automatic in his left hand. Inside, Pirelli, Scanchy, and Fanagan looked at him. Nobody said anything. Okay said the orange kid. Here we go. He put his right hand inside his coat, brought it out with something that looked like an orange in it. He threw it into the room, stepped back, shut the door. As he ran for the stairway, the bomb detonated. The roar shook the inn. Downstairs, a woman shrieked. The orange kid put his foot down on the accelerator and headed for the state line. He didn't expect to get far, but it was worth trying. He was doing 70. He took his right hand off the wheel and felt about on the floor. After a second, he found the orange he was feeling for. He changed it over to his left hand and drove with his right. He bit hard through the orange skin and appreciated the tang of the juice. Somewhere behind him, a police siren shrieked. Peter Cheney Reginald Evelyn Peter Southhouse Cheney was born in 1896 in Whitechapel, London, the youngest of five children. At the age of 15, his parents removed him from Hounslow College, where the only subject for which he had shown any aptitude was mathematics. After a spell in a solicitor's office, he embarked on a career in the theatre, appearing in plays such as Break Down the Walls and The Butterfly on the Wheel. He enlisted on the outbreak of war in 1914, but was invalided home after being wounded by a bomb in the Second Battle of the Somme two years later. Despite his experiences in the First World War, during the Second World War, at the height of his fame, Cheney joined the Home Guard and commanded its sole armoured unit. After the Great War, Cheney had returned to the theatre, writing character sketches and songs for music hall artists such as Nellie Wallace and Albert Whelan. 
He also took to the stage himself, and in 1923 performed monologues and songs on 2LO, which became the British Broadcasting Company. Cheney also produced several plays, but the rewards were low, so he got a job as a journalist, reviewing new films, writing special features, and working as a crime reporter. Around this time, while going through a protracted divorce from his first wife, Cheney decided to try his hand at fiction. Published as newspaper serials, these early efforts had Romeresque titles like The Gold Kimono, 1930, The Vengeance of Hop Fee, 1931, Death Chair, 1931, and Deadly Fresco, 1932. A friend then bet Cheney that he couldn't write a thriller in the American gangster vernacular. The result, This Man is Dangerous, 1936, was the first novel to feature Lemmy Caution, a character whose language and mannerisms are almost laughable today, but in the 1930s and 40s was so popular that one newspaper would later estimate that Cheney had earned the equivalent of more than £10 million from his many books. Ironically, None of them was published by the Crime Club. Peter Cheney died in a London hospital on the 26th of June 1951 with his third wife at his bedside. He had been suffering from bronchitis and heart trouble. The Orange Kid was published by the Sunday Dispatch on the 6th of March 1938. And the answer was by Ethel Lena White. Before you go home, Jones, said Timothy Rolls, bring me in a cup of tea and three ham sandwiches. Casually, he rattled off the order, which was to be of vital importance to his destiny. Are you working late, boss? asked his staff, a youth of seventeen. Yes, Jones, I'm not so lucky as you. I've a darn bad employer, but he won't sack me, and I can't give him notice. His staff grinned dutifully at his joke, which expressed his pride and wonder at being his own master. As he sat at his sewing machine in the window of his shop, the light glared down on him. He was a little man with a plucky smile and pale from a constant steam atmosphere. His large eyes held a wistful expression, which was the result of muddled thinking about war, unemployment and eternity. But that evening, their gravity sprang from a different cause. He was concerned about the recent murders in the town. Two women had been killed, and the criminal was still at large. As long as he lurked hidden, like the shadow quivering in deep seawater, which alone betrays the presence of the shark, there was menace to every unprotected girl. In particular, Rolls feared for his fellow boarder, Miss Loretta Smith, who was employed in the bureau of the Bear Hotel and kept late hours. She was an attractive blonde with a smart line of repartee and sound sense which would make her an ideal life partner to a young man starting in business. Because of her possible peril, Rolls scowled at the pair of trousers he was repairing while his staff came back with his tea. The youth had left a few minutes when the doorbell jangled violently to announce a customer of municipal importance, the mayor of Millbrook. He was a prosperous and popular auctioneer, sandy and burly, who modelled himself on John Bull and thereby did the national character grave injustice. At first, Rose did not recognise him, for his normally florid face was pale and his light overcoat splashed with mud. Been bowled over by a blasted bike, he panted. Chap scorched off before I could take his number. Here, take my coat and clean it up. Can't go through the town looking like a tramp. Rolls carried the coat over to the board, and conscious that he was watched, tried to make a sponging record before placing the garment between the steam rollers. When the mayor recovered his breath, he began to chat. How'd you like the provinces after London rolls? Fine, sir. This town's more friendly than London. Only uh, it's not safe for ladies until they catch this murderer. Hmm. He seems too smart for the police. 
not quite, sir. I lodge with Mrs Bull, and her husband's been in the force, so I get inside dope. He says these mystery cases are usually the work of a sort of Jekyll and Hyde, like the film. The police may know who he is, but they can't convict him without direct evidence. And the people who know won't tell. I would. Or fool you. Suppose you got something on some big man. Who's going to believe you? They'd think you potty. And if there's the least shadow of doubt, you might as well put up your shutters. You'd be finished here. Rolls shuddered at the thought as he turned the coat inside out to examine the lining. Arrested by the sight of a dark smear around the pocket, he made a closer examination. I'm afraid, sir, he suggested diffidently. This coat ought to be sent to the cleaners. I couldn't get out the blood. Blood. The mayor's voice was that of a stranger. Their eyes met. In that moment, Rolls felt transported to a dark, unfamiliar place where he was locked in a stranglehold of horror. It's him, he thought. I'm holding the evidence here in my hands. If he won't leave the coat, I'll know. I must ring the police. He can't kill me here with people passing the window, but I must keep the coat. Suddenly he returned to his own brightly lit shop at the sound of the mayor's laugh. Oh, good show. That's the other chap's claret, not mine. Glad he got what was coming to him. Well, Rolls, send the coat to be properly cleaned. When do you knock off? I'll be late tonight, sir. Good night, sir. Directly he was alone, Rolls locked the garment in his press. Although the mayor had vindicated himself, he felt vaguely upset by the incident. He went back to his machine, gulping down his tea and sandwiches as he worked. It was after nine when he finished, which was too late to go back to the boarding house and too early to meet Miss Loretta. He decided, therefore, to go to the pictures, although he had to pay more than his usual price for a seat since the cinema was crowded. He enjoyed the first film, because he could imagine Loretta as the blonde, wisecracking heroine. But the second was disquieting. It was about a girl who witnessed a murder and consequently became a fugitive from gangsters. To increase his discomfort, he grew extremely thirsty, the penalty for eating lean ham plastered with mustard, so that he could only think of ways of getting something to drink. All the public houses would be closed, and also the cafes. Eventually, however, he remembered a coffee stall, which was open all night for the benefit of motor traffic. While he was at the cinema, his boarding house was honoured by a personal visit from the mayor. I want to see young Rolls, he said pompously to the overworked slattern who answered his ring. I'll go up and wait for him if he's not in. Where's his room? Top. First door replied the woman. Right, I'll find my way up. Don't wait. I'll let myself out. Apparently he was doomed to a long vigil, for it was after eleven when Rolls left the cinema and began to trudge towards the Gloucester Road. Presently he left the shops behind him and reached a bleak, indeterminate region where town and country fused in a desolate road. As he caught sight of the cheery glow from the coffee stall, he hurried towards it eagerly fishing the while for the last coin in his pocket. When he held it to the light, he found, to his keen disappointment, that instead of being sixpence, it was a farthing. Too late, he remembered that he had paid extra for his seat at the cinema. As he lingered on the muddy footpath, too diffident to borrow from strangers, he was cheered by another recollection. The room below his own at the boarding house was occupied by a genial married couple, the Mitchells. The man was conductor of the Bear Hotel Orchestra and came home late, when his wife always made coffee for him in their room. Rolls was sure that they would not grudge him a cup. He turned to hurry back, when his attention was caught by something a man at the stall was saying. She put up a good fight, but she was all in when my Alf heard her holler. 
bleeding like a stuck pig she was, but they say at the hospital she'll pull through. What's that? asked Rose. Not heard. The man was delighted to get a new listener. Major Blake's daughter was attacked by a chap with a knife on her way home from hockey. Young Alf chased him, but he got away. The girl says his face was covered with a dark handkerchief, but he was a big chap and wore a light fawn overcoat. Well, what time? quavered Rolls. Round about 6.30. Rolls grew cold as he made a rapid calculation. At that time, he had sent his staff home, and the mayor had burst into his shop a few minutes later. He hurried back to the town, a prey to conflicting emotions. A bomb seemed to have exploded inside his brain, spattering blazing thoughts. Me, a little repairing tailor, against his worship the mayor. He'll stick to his tale about the blood coming from the cyclist, and the police won't have it tested to compare it with the young ladies. And suppose he doesn't want any talk. I'm the only one that knows. Suddenly he realised the loneliness of his surroundings. On one side was a cemetery, on the other a football ground. The dim light revealed a cinder path, a thorn hedge, and a hoarding where torn posters hung forlornly. Every shadow was a crouching form, poised to spring, every corner a test for quivering nerves. When, at long last, Rose reached the security of the high street, he was exhausted and out of breath. Released from fear, he grew conscious again of his thirst. By this time, it had increased to a pitch of near torture, when every shred of ham turned to a little red devil, goading his baked tongue. Suddenly, he saw, lying upon the pavement, an orange, which had evidently rolled from a shuttered fruiterer's shop. In that parched moment, it seemed a wish fulfilled, but although his eyes gleamed, he did not pick it up. He was very particular about food, and shrank from eating an orange that had been lying in the dirt of the street. As he passed it, the town hall clock began to strike. To his dismay, he counted three chimes. By a quarter to twelve, the Mitchells would be in bed. No coffee for him from them. Water, then? That, too, was denied him. He could not grope down into the basement without disturbing the Bull family who slept there, and he dared not risk drinking from his dingy carafe, which, in spite of his complaints, always smelt stale. Turning back, he picked up the orange. By the time he reached Madeira Terrace, he had wiped it clean and scooped out a bit of peel. As he let himself into the stuffy gloom of the hall, he began to suck the juicy pulp greedily, noisily. Treading softly, he felt his way upstairs. When he reached the Mitchell's room, no light shone through the transom, so he began to creep up the last flight. Suddenly, the darkness above him seemed to shake slightly, as though someone had moved. Aware that something was wrong, he dropped his orange and made an instinctive dart forward towards the light switch. In the same moment, he felt a dull crash upon his skull, as though the roof had fallen. And then, he knew no more. Before he could fall, a man, who bore some resemblance to the mayor, caught him and tugged him inside his room. This person was worked up to a state of dangerous excitement when the veins in his temples beat like tiny gongs, and a red mist obscured his sight. Dragging his victim over to the gas fire, he draped an eiderdown over him and the stove, and then turned on the tap. There was a frozen grin of ferocity upon his lips as he pocketed his weapon, a length of lead piping wrapped in a woolen sock, before he laid a letter upon the table. It was in his own handwriting and bore his signature, but was, by implication, Timothy Rolls's suicide letter. Dear Rolls, read the matter we discussed in your shop this evening. I regret I can advance no capital to finance your business. My feeling is, you should have the guts to succeed without help, as I did myself. Shutting the door carefully behind him, 
the mayor prepared to steal from the house. His foot had barely touched the first step when he trod on the slippery remains of the orange. Instantly his heel shot out and he crashed heavily down the stairs. As he lay at the bottom, half stunned, the landing light was switched on, and a huge band conductor, looking like Hercules in pajamas, rushed out. Why, Mr. Mayor, he shouted, what's up, sir? It was then that the shock of his fall proved the mayor's undoing, since it had restarted the old mental trouble, previously released by a recent accident to his head. Dazed and unaware of his action, he drew out his cosh and tried to attack the conductor. While the two men struggled together, Mitchell bellowed an order to his wife. Little Rolls, see if he's all right. As the two young gentlemen from the drapery rushed out of their rooms to assist her husband, Mrs. Mitchell nipped up the stairs for she could smell gas. The bedroom was far from being lethal, but Rolls, who had monopolized most of the output from the stove, was already passing into a nice long sleep. She opened the window, turned the tap of the gas, and then dropped on her knees beside the unconscious man. Rolling him over and over, she got him outside the room. An hour later, he was still on the landing, lying on a pile of rugs while his room was being aired. He had already surrendered his keys to the police, who had the blood-stained coat in their possession besides the person of the mayor. All around him were the other boarders, and drinks were in circulation as each person shouted against the other. Presently, Rolls spoke to Loretta, alone. I keep thinking how queer things work out. Are they planned? Why did I have to pick up an orange at 11.45 to save my life? Orange? repeated Loretta smartly, snapping at her chance. Then the answer is not a lemon. Ethel Lena White Ethel Lena White, 1876 to 1944, was born in Wales, and together with several of her siblings, worked for her father's construction materials business. After their mother died and the family lost all their money, White and two sisters moved to London, where she got a job with the Ministry of Pensions. She had been writing for many years and had had several short stories published. In the mid-1920s, she completed her first novel, The Wishbone, 1927, and the modest success of this and two other early titles, including the futuristic fantasy The Eternal Journey, 1930, prompted her to take up writing as a career. Her first novel-length mystery, Put Out the Light, 1931, is a brilliantly structured puzzle. It is especially noteworthy for the focus on the psychology of the characters, something that became a hallmark of her work. White's many novels included Some Must Watch, 1935, filmed as The Spiral Staircase, 1946, and The Wheel Spins, 1936, filmed as The Lady Vanishes, 1939. Both films have been remade and her work remains popular with anthologists. Even at the height of her success, White shunned publicity and would not talk about herself. As Peter Cheney wrote in introduction to this story, she says in answer to my queries, I was not born, I have never been educated, and have no tastes or hobbies. This is my story, and I'm sticking to it. And the answer was, was published by the Sunday Dispatch on the 13th of March, 1938. He Stooped to Live by David Hume The man enjoying his Christmas Eve by arranging a couple of violent deaths lit another cigarette and smiled at the three men facing him. They did not smile. Their boss, Steve Kelly, might take it the wrong way. And if he did, startling things might happen. Charlie Ross ain't gonna reach Christmas Day, said Kelly. And Sammy Prince won't be far into the new year. Everything's in the bag. Blimey, Steve, said the man on his left. You aren't gonna see both of them out of the party, are you? You guess well, mate. 
When I fix things, they stay fixed. So that goes for both of them. Think I was going to take any more rough stuff from blokes like them and sit back twiddling my fingers? Forget it. Well, we know you're a smart Alec boss, but our own crowd is pretty hot. We don't want the cops putting the skids under us. You're shouting hot air. Ever know me arrange things so that they went wrong? That wasn't how I came to sit on top of the dump, was it? I reckon I've stacked this deck of cards so that they just can't come unstuck. I've got everything that opens and shuts. But what the hell are you blokes screaming about? Don't you reckon they've done enough to ask for all that's coming to them? They've certainly given us a real basin of trouble. But still... Stow it, snapped Kelly. We cased that Walworth warehouse, didn't we? Had everything set, hadn't we? And Charlie and Sammy dive into the dump under our noses and clean the lot up. Think I'll stand for that? We worked that Bruton Street smash. And what happened? Charlie and Sammy stuck up our lads, knew we couldn't squeal and got away with the whole issue. Nah, they've got to pay for it and pay plenty. You reckon you've worked out a really fast stroke, eh? I could laugh about it. I reckon I've struck a new joke. Know what I've fixed? Oh, <laughs> you'd never guess. You can leave little Steve to hit the eye spots. We're going to murder Charlie Ross, and Sammy Prince is going to take the long drop for it. Can you beat that, mates? Murder the one and get the other swung. I call that a bit arty. Kelly smiled again. The other men gaped incredulously. Thought that would tickle you, he said. I'll tell you the old lay, then you'll see the certainty we're backing. In half an hour's time, Charlie Ross will be heading along Landor Road for home. I fixed that. He's at the Stockwell Casual Club now. So is one of my boys, and he's escorting Charlie from the club to see that he arrives where we want him about half past eleven. He'll leave Charlie at the corner and we put him all set for the mortuary slab. But that's only the beginning. Sammy and Charlie have had some trouble. Seems they couldn't quite agree about their last split. It wasn't 50-50. Sammy has been shouting a dome off his head, telling the world that he's been crossed and double-crossed, mentioning just a few of the things likely to happen to Charlie when they meet. A dozen boys have heard his squeals. I know them and I can slam him into the box at the Old Bailey to start the gallows march. But even that's nothing. You blokes know I hold my ears pinned to the floor when the boys start talking. Right, I've got the best information in the world that Sammy's pulling a single-handed stroke tonight. So he's sunk when the splits collect him, and he starts thinking about an alibi. There's plenty more yet. Sammy left his place two hours ago. He didn't take his car. I've got it tucked away round the corner now. We're going to use that bus when we crease Charlie. Well, I don't mind if a few folks get a good look at it. I don't mind if they remember the registration number. As soon as we've done the rubbing out, we're going to head towards Crouch End and abandon a car some distance from Sammy's hangout. And in the lever work, I'm going to slide the gun I used on Charlie. There won't be any prints on it. The splits wouldn't expect a cute bloke like Sammy to leave any. Then, to complete the picture, I'll see that the cops receive a mysterious message. Just a nice, homely little story about a row between the pair of them. They know that Sammy's got a record that has stretched from here to Dartmoor. Believe me. They'll collect him before he can fill the kids' Christmas stockings. Now, what do you say? The three men nodded appreciatively. They certainly had to hand it to Steve Kelly. He knew everything it needed to fix things. The boss rose slowly to his feet, pulled a pair of gloves over his hands, smiled again as he slid an automatic from his pocket, examined it, and replaced it. Then he grabbed a hat and headed for the door. They were all set. Come along. I want you three to drop off the car at odd places when I tell you. I'm going to dump the car myself. 
but the bunch had better start in on the party in case anything slips up. The men filed out of the room. A minute later, they were on their way. It was exactly twenty-five minutes before midnight, when Charlie Ross lurched to the pavement in Landor Road with a bullet in his brain. The man staggering about the pavement along East End Road, East Finchley, showed every sign that his Christmas Eve had been celebrated with more enthusiasm than discretion. In his right hand, he carried a heaped basket of mixed fruit. The task of balancing the fruity pile at moments caused him extreme difficulty. Twice an orange from the summit of the stack bounced to the pavement, and both times the reveller laid down his basket, cursed, bent down as though likely to arrive on the sidewalk for the full count, and recovered the fruit. A few yards behind him, a little man was watching the performance with a smile. Then, for the third time, the orange arrived on the pavement. For an instant, the inebriate hesitated, swaying like a reed in a gale. At last, he reached a decision, kicked at the fruit, missed it, and continued with staggering progress. The man following in his wake picked up the orange, started to hurry after the reveller, changed his mind, and slipped it into his pocket. A local church clock chimed quarter to midnight. Anxious to arrive at home, Sammy Prince kept his hand on the orange, hastened his step along Archway Road, cut off along a side street soon after passing through Highgate. His wife was waiting for him in their unpretentious house. Before he had time to slide out of his overcoat, a double rap sounded on the door. Sammy opened it and gasped. He knew detectives quite well when he met them. I thought you hadn't had time to get out of your gear, said one of the officers. We're taking you along with us. Are you ready? Why, oh, mister, what have I done? You can't grab folks like this. Maybe at the station you'll be telling us what you've done tonight. Sammy winced, cursed softly. What a start to Christmas Day. He knew argument was useless. So he waved to his wife and vanished into the night. For hours at the police station, Sammy faced a battery of questions. He shook his head over and over again, asked why he was wanted. Finally, a divisional inspector shot the simple remark, Charlie Ross was murdered tonight, and you can tell us plenty. The little man shook his head emphatically. Now he knew that he could maintain silence no longer. So, with a shrug of his shoulders, he gave them the news. He had made an unsuccessful attempt to break into a house near St. Marylebone Cemetery. He was never out of North London. Had anyone seen him? No. Could anyone swear to an alibi? No. So the inspector talked for five minutes, reciting the abundant evidence in their hands to prove that Sammy shot his friend that he was in South London. Prince spent two days in jail, pacing the cell helplessly. He was in a jam, couldn't see a way out. The police had searched him, laughed when they found the orange, handed it back to him. Without thinking, he took a bite at the fruit. Then the jailer dashed through the cell door for Sammy had raised a vicious curse and spat the piece of orange on the cell floor. What on earth's wrong? Can't you even eat an orange? You must be mad. Mad be damned, man. I'm, I've never in all my life. Sammy ceased speaking with dramatic suddenness, stared at the orange, remembered the queer antics of the Christmas Eve reveller. Then he shouted hurriedly, Get me a lawyer immediately, and I want a good one. Hurry up. Half an hour later, a solicitor left the police station with the orange in his pocket. he just heard a queer story. It fascinated him. Sammy waited patiently for the time for his court appearance. He felt better. Prince's appearance before the court was weird and wonderful. Counsel representing him decided to save time by making a statement. He had already consulted with Crown Counsel. His opening was startling. 
The defence in this case is an unbreakable alibi. A gentleman named West won a prize in the Christmas draw at the East Finchley Bachelor Club. He was presented with a basket of fruit. At the top of the pile was an orange. Some fellow members of the club decided to play a practical joke on Mr. West, who admits quite candidly that he was intoxicated. Using a fountain pen filler, they pierced a hole in the orange, injected into the fruit a considerable quantity of olive oil and an amount of ink. Eight members of that club are in court today to testify that Mr. West left the club at half-past eleven. His father is here to swear that his son arrived home at midnight. The odds would be ten million to one against there being any other such orange in the world. On his way home, Mr. West lost that orange. The accused will tell you the circumstances in which he picked it up in East End Road, East Finchley. A fruit was in his possession when he was taken into custody. He will tell you that he picked up that orange at exactly a quarter to twelve. While in custody, the accused took a bite at the orange, discovered the appalling taste, realized the significance of it, and arranged for the fruit to be analyzed. As the result of that analysis, his legal advisers appealed through the press for assistance in tracing the orange. The task was not difficult. The club members came forward immediately with their story. There is little more to state. Charlie Ross, the deceased, was shot in Landor Road, Clapham, at about 11.35. In East Finchley, some twelve miles from the scene of the murder, the accused, who had no car with him, picked up the orange that must have been lost by Mr. West at some time between half-past eleven and before midnight. For the accused to have committed this crime is a complete impossibility. Reflect that he was arrested at his home shortly after midnight, and that, having picked up the orange in East Finchley, he was moving towards Clapham and not away from it. That fact alone demonstrates the accuracy of his statement when he placed the time of the incident at 11.45. I will call the witnesses as soon as it is convenient. Two hours later, Sammy Prince was discharged. An orange he had stooped to collect had saved his life. David Hume David Hume was one of the pen names used by John Victor Turner, 1900-1945, who was known to his family as Jack. He also wrote crime fiction as J. V. Turner and as Nicholas Brady, whose series character was the Reverend Ebenezer Buckle. Born in Warwickshire in 1900, Jack Turner left school at 16 to work on the Manchester Advertiser and later moved to Walton in Staffordshire, where he worked on a Leicestershire newspaper before joining the law court staff of the national newspaper, the Daily Mail. After his wife committed suicide, the result of severe postnatal depression, Turner became crime reporter on the Daily Herald, where he claimed to have a network of contacts in the London underworld. Drawing on his experience, he began writing fiction, and his first novel, Bullets Bite Deep, was published in 1932. Its success led Hume to give up his career as a journalist, and he went on to write dozens of fast-moving thrillers, many of which feature Mick Cardby, the quick-decisioned, hard-slogging, amazingly intrepid younger partner in a famous firm of private detectives. Several of Turner's books were made into films, and, badged by his publisher as the new Edgar Wallace, he claimed at one time to be writing a novel a fortnight. Although none of his Hugh Moore Brady novels were published by the Crime Club, it did publish two of the seven mysteries written as by J. V. Turner, Homicide Haven, 1935, and Below the Clock, 1936. On the 3rd of February, 1945, Turner died at his home in Eastern Road, Haywards Heath, apparently after contracting tuberculosis. A few days later, he was cremated at Brighton Crematorium, mourned by his children and his second wife, to whom he left only £300, equivalent to about £13,000 today. He Stooped to Live was published by the Sunday Dispatch 
on the 20th of March, 1938. Mr. Prendergast and the Orange by Nicholas Blake There were five of us in the room that afternoon, listening to the carol service from King's College Chapel. Nigel Strangeways, as usual, had his ear right up against the radio. He liked his music hot and strong, he said. Prendergast, the nice little man he had brought along with him, was sitting bolt upright in an armchair. He looked worried and attentive, like a clerk being interviewed for a job. One expected to see the bowler hat and the pair of shabby kid gloves on his knee. Hales, Aston and myself made up the party. The last refrain of the holly and the ivy died away, with that long, beautifully controlled diminuendo in which the King's College choir excels. The playing on the merry organ, sweet singing in the choir. Nigel turned the knob, and the room was silent for a few moments. Then Hales launched forth. Yes, it's all very fine, but it's artificial. Nowadays there's nothing at Christmas but the professional sort of stuff we've been listening to, and those dismal gangs of brats who go around caterwauling good King Wenceslas out of tune all December. All the joy, the spontaneity is gone. Now, in the good old days, in the good old days, you had a gang of drunks going round blaring out good King Wenceslas equally out of tune, no doubt. Aston can never resist pulling the leg of Hales's hobby horse. Soon they were at it hammer and tongs, and the atmosphere got quite heated. Nigel interposed, changing the subject tactfully. You ought to tell them about that Christmas you were arrested for murder, Joe. We all gazed at the little man with interest. Mr. Prendergast fidgeted, looking bashful, sulky, and deeply gratified in turn, like a boy asked to recite in a Victorian drawing room. Then. Rather breathlessly, he began. It was the orange, really. I, I mean, if it hadn't been for the orange, I shouldn't be here to tell the tale. The orange, and Mr. Strangeways, of course, bobbing his head in Nigel's direction. Five years ago it was, about the middle of December. I'd lost my job, and the wife and kiddies, well, you know how it is. So I decided to go down to Cheltenham and make a last appeal to my aunt. Eliza Metcalf. She'd never answered my letters. My mother married beneath her, she thought, and she'd said none of us should ever cross her threshold. Very hard woman was Eliza Metcalf, gentlemen. Eliza Metcalf. Now I remembered. Rich recluse found murdered. A man had been arrested, and... So I thought, well, perhaps if I go to see her myself... She might lend me enough to tide us over. So I, I took a ticket to Cheltenham, cleaned me out it did, and went to her house. I can see her now with her lace mittens and ivory stick. An old-fashioned lady, you know, but hard as nails. She pitched into me, too. My word! What did I mean by forcing my way into her house? My mother'd been no better than a you-know-what. She'd see the pack of us dead before she gave us any help. Well, I was desperate, and I told her so. And after a while she sort of relented. Young man, she said a bit gruffly, it's against my principles to lend money. I'll give you ten pounds, and don't let me see your face again. I reckon she felt a bit guilty, you know. It was like conscience money. At any rate, she went into the next room, and I heard her rummaging about. When she returned, she was sucking her finger. She'd pricked it on a needle in the drawer where the money was kept, I suppose. There was a stain of blood on one of the pound notes she handed me. Nearly did for me, that blood stain. Mr. Prendergast paused, a look of consternation creeping into his eyes as he remembered that dreadful night five years ago. What about the orange? said Aston gently. I'm coming to that. Well, gentlemen, I dare say ten pounds doesn't mean much to any of you, but when you're on your uppers, it's as good as a million. I walked out of the house and had a cup of coffee at a stall. The chap who kept the stall noticed that I was all excited. 
agitated was the word the police used afterwards. You see, I was thinking that the kiddies would be able to have their Christmas presents after all. That was just 10.30 p.m. A lovely night, stars and frost twinkling, and that ten quid in my pocket. So I thought I'd take a bit of a walk. I'd no idea where I was going. In the end, I found myself walking up a long hill right out of the town. The Sirencester Road, they told me it was later. I was so elated I didn't particularly notice anyone I passed or what roads I took. And believe it or not, I'd been walking for three quarters of an hour before I realised I'd left my stick behind at Aunt Lizzie's. It was a nice stick, an ash plant with a silver band and my initials on it. The wife had given it me for my birthday, so I thought I'd call in at Aunt Lizzie's and pick it up before I found a place to sleep the night. Well, I'd got to the end of the street where her house was, and that's when I saw it, in the street, in the lamplight. The orange. A nice, big, juicy orange, said Nigel, dreamily. Now, I'm an inquisitive chap, and I, I couldn't help asking myself whoever could it be that went about so late at night dropping oranges. I could have sworn it wasn't there when I'd come along this street before, I bent down to pick it up. Funny, you know, for a moment I thought it might be some sort of practical joke, like leaving red-hot pennies on the pavement. Mr Prendergast blushed and giggled. Somehow it made us all feel very warm-hearted towards him. I bent down to pick it up, and just then it, it struck a quarter to twelve. And what happened? asked Hales excitedly. Nothing. Not at the moment. I put the orange in my pocket. I noticed there were tooth marks in the skin and went along to Aunt Lizzie's. There were lights in the window still. I thought I'd best go round to the back and ask the maid to give me my stick. I didn't want to knock up against Aunt Liz again that night. So I went quietly down the side passage and walked straight into a policeman. What's your business here, he said. I'm Miss Metcalfe's nephew, I said. He took me inside. I was told my aunt had been found murdered. It knocked me over, I can tell you. I remember saying, in a dazed sort of way, I came back to get my stick. And at that very moment the maid came in. Why, that's the gentleman who was here two hours ago. Him I was telling you about, she said. Two days later I was arrested. Mr Prendergast paused, tantalisingly. You'd better ask Mr Strangeways to tell you the rest of the story he said at last. I became interested in the case through Inspector Blount, a friend of mine, Nigel began crisply. The case against Joe Prendergast was based on the following pieces of circumstantial evidence. 1. The maid overheard a scene between him and her mistress, in the course of which he exclaimed, I'm desperate, I'd do anything to get it. 2. After this they had lowered their voices, and the maid, losing interest, had slipped out to post some letters met her young man, and not returned till nearly eleven o'clock. Three. On her return, the maid found Miss Metcalf in the hall, her head battered in. Four. The drawers in Miss Metcalf's boudoir had been rifled. There were eight five-pound notes and ten one-pound notes missing. Five. The one-pound notes were discovered in Joe's pocketbook. There was blood on one of them, of the same blood group as the deceased's. 6. The bundle of five-pound notes was found later hidden in a hedge beside the Sirencester Road. 7. The coffee stall owner recognised the prisoner as the man who had come to his stall in a highly agitated condition on the night of the crime. 8. The prisoner had endeavoured to get into the back garden, and in this garden the police found his walking stick, blood-stained, with strands of the deceased's hair clinging to it. The theory was, of course, that Miss Metcalfe had refused Joe any assistance, that he had struck her down, stolen the money, and in his panic flung away the stick as he left the house, that he had then gone for a walk to steady his nerves, realised that the five-pound notes were traceable, and hidden them in the hedge, and returned to get the stick, the most damning evidence against him. Well, it seemed a watertight case, but there were things in it that puzzled me. I got permission to interview Joe, and he convinced me that his version of the story was the right one. 
but it wasn't till he told me about the orange that I saw any hope of proving it. I'll put it to you like this. Who would throw away a perfectly good orange in which he had set his teeth late at night in the middle of December? We racked our brains. A number of theories were evolved, some flippant, all more or less fantastic. I imagined a murderer creeping out of Miss Metcalfe's house with an orange he had stolen, starting to eat it, then flinging it down in revulsion. But he wouldn't do murder for an orange unless he was starving, said Nigel patiently. And if he was starving, he wouldn't throw it away. No, the whole point is, 